Cool. We got up in twenty seconds, man. Okay, yeah, I better stop pontificating. But you, you see what I'm saying? That doesn't oh, yeah. work. Oh yeah. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna go live here on YouTube. Give me a second here. Hey, everybody on YouTube, welcome back for another live show of Spaced Out Radio as we're about five and a half minutes away from getting going here tonight on <laughs> Spaced Out Radio. And I just want to say hello to each and every one of you for hanging on out with us tonight. And, you know, we got a great show. Micah Hanks is going to be here and and well, he's actually here right now. And uh, is he? Well, are you? Are you? Are you here? <laughs> that's news to me. <laughs> oh, that's news to me, man. That's news to me. How you been doing, buddy? I've been doing wonderfully. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Uh... In light of, well, in light of current events, I mean, I'm doing as well as I could be doing, I guess. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. You know that this. I'll tell you this coronavirus thing. And and, and uh, hey, Waylon. Hey, cable guy, Matt. Cable Guy Matt. Love Cable Guy Matt around here. Wayland, you're pretty awesome, too. Cable Guy Matt uh, takes care of all my internet stuff. So we call oh. him Cable Guy Matt. Oh, I have a visitor coming in here. Let me see who it is. Hey, big guy. No. How are you? Daddy's kind of working right no. now. Oh, you put your cologne on and your deodorant. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Now you got to wash your face because you got chocolate on it. Yeah. Give me a high five. Thanks, buddy. That's how I high five. Love you. Okay, Daddy's got to go to work. I'm going to here. Oh, hold on, Micah. I'm being strangled here. Oh. Okay, off to, off to get ready for bed. Quick. This has been a special report brought to you in part by Spaced Out Radio. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't mind that. I don't mind that whatsoever. I'll give a shout out. Uh, hey, Renee. Hey, Bigfoot, Michigan, Rob, Mala. How are you? Magolan, Derek, how are you all? Thank you for joining us. We are about three minutes away from getting things going here on Spaced Out Radio. Micah Hanks, the lovely and talented with us again, the man who can rock a pair of Ray-Bans like anybody else. You know, that's just the way it is. Isn't that right, Micah? That is exactly how it is. Where are my Ray-Bans, by the way? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know? I really don't Around know. Around here. Hey, Audra. <laughs> Bill, WD-40, how are you? Poetically mistaken, good to see you again. All right. <laughs> oh, Micah, see, now, you, you, you know what? We've only, believe it or not, people, Micah and I have only had like three conversations previous to this. And one was the first time he was on this show and the phone call beforehand. So this is like conversation number four that we're having right now. And I'll tell you, Micah, you, you make me laugh. I don't know what the hell it is, but you just make me laugh. And I appreciate that, man. Whatever that is, I appreciate it, too. Powder donuts make me go nuts. Oh, but anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, now I'm worried about those Ray Bans. You know, it's going to be hard for me to complete my uh, my 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 guest duties without the proper eye gear. I know. I know. Are you are you okay? I do my are you okay though? Yeah, I'll be okay. I'll be All okay. Right. Yeah, I'm not Orbison. Yeah, I just prefer working in the dark. I guess. Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm what? in the dark most of the time. <laughs> you know what? There is something to be said, honestly, about working at night. That is just so much better. I love working at night. I really do. Yeah, there's that, that ambiance of the evening. Very different kind of productivity than, than daytime. Oh, I'll huge. say that. Huge. Huge. Do you find you get more done at, at, at night than in daytime? You know, it depends. Normally, I'm, you're going to laugh, but I uh, am a morning person. I think I've tried my whole life to kind of be more of a night owl yeah. because it's sort of expected in this genre. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't work. I mean, I, uh, I could stay up all night and my body still will wake me up at, you know, at least by the latest 8 a.m., yeah. usually earlier if I've actually gotten sleep the night before. And so, yeah, I get up, I'm, I'm ready to go. But the thing about working at night is that you're more relaxed. And so, yeah, sometimes oh, yeah. it does help productivity. So if I don't feel like, you know, if I'm restless and I can't sleep, yeah, I absolutely 
can be more productive at night because all yeah. the distractions of the day, all the phone calls, they go out the window. It's just you and the dark baby. All right, buddy. Like three seconds. Here we go. Hit it. All right. All right, YouTube. Here we go. We're going to kick things off. Music is on. Don't forget, we got the super chat going, and you can buy any Spaced Out Radio swag on our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop. Make sure you do that. We're going for a good one tonight. Hold on here. Here we go. Bumblefoot's getting us ready. I'm warmed up. Here we go. From the snowy mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters, welcoming all of you to tonight's show, including Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. we got a plethora of features for you there, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Writer, podcaster, researcher, adventurer, Micah Hanks wears a lot of different hats as he is the master of his own domain. He's a man whose interests cover a variety of topics, including history, archaeology, philosophy, science, and the future of humankind. Along with his podcast, Micah is a writer who has numbered and authored a number of books and has contributed many essays, articles, and blogs to various publications. He has also worked as a narrator because he's definitely got the voice for it, lending his voice to several audiobooks, radio programs, and other recorded projects over the years. And the best part for all of us, he's a weirdo as well. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Micah Hanks, always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio tonight. How you doing, man? Pleasure's mine. Doing great. All things considered, these are strange and trying times, but I'm trying hard. I got to ask you this. As somebody who makes his living off of research and doing what you normally do, talking on the phone, has, has this current situation around the planet made your job tougher or easier because people are easier to get a hold of? Uh, it's a little of both. That's a really good point. You know, my my job has been harder in the sense that I'm I'm working more because let me put it to you like this, and this is something that you of all people will absolutely relate to. I have a background in terrestrial broadcast radio. Okay, I cut my teeth. Yes, you know, with there you're in a room full of microphones. There's a window to your right and a window to your left. To your left, you're looking into the next studio doing a broadcast live on another station in your cluster. To the right, there's the newsroom, and you see the people in the newsroom in there putting together the news for the bottom of the hour or the top of the hour. And every now and then, when stuff's getting real, your news director comes you know, around down through the hall into your studio and says, we've got news. You guys go live right now. And it was always this mentality of when there are things happening in the world that are of importance – you have to go and you have to do what a broadcaster does. You inform the public. And so yeah. for me, with with all the stuff going on in the world right now, yeah, I'm in a position where I feel like I've got to have a level of of information and uh, and and etiquette, you know, as well, because you've got to be able to be a communicator uh, or have the right voices who can help you communicate. Uh, by the same token, and you and I talked about this before we went live, uh, we also, as entertainers, you know, in the podcasting and the radio genre, we want to be able to provide that escape for people. And so we also have to be able to, you know, maintain business as usual, right? Pretend like nothing is happening in the world that's unusual or out of place. And so it's a little strange, but I will say that, like you pointed out, with everybody stuck at home, it has been great to be able to get in touch, reconnect with old friends, you know, line up guests. Hey, I'm not going anywhere. I'll come on your show. And vice versa. So I'm doing a lot more interviews right now and booking a lot of them, too. You know, it always reminds me, I mean, you being a, a radio guy, me being a radio guy, you, when, when you are in a situation like we are right now on this planet, a lot of people won't understand this unless you've done it. But there's no place that I would rather be right now than in my old newsroom, helping out, 
finding stories, creating stories, telling the events that are going on. A, there's something of a rush on that. Now, you know, I mean, not to bring up a, a morbid topic here, but, you know, I remember working in the newsroom the day 9-11 happened. And as yeah. scary and as freaky as that was, I felt safe being in the newsroom and getting the helping get those stories out. Were you pretty much the same way? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I didn't work in radio when 9-11 happened. Uh, you know, I'm a youngling, right? Uh, yes. Fairly new to the Jedi. I was, this is no joke. I was, um, in, in when, yeah, okay, in 2001, when 9-11 happened, I had just graduated from high school. And so I think I was working in like a t-shirt shop in the local mall. And uh, I remember getting the <laughs> kids at home. Back in the day, we used to have to use these metal appendages called antennas on the top of a television set. And if you got them in just the right position, then you could pick up the local broadcast. And I actually saw the second tower fall through a static screen while I was adjusting these antennas on this little box that my uh, business managers kept at the store that I worked at at that time. So many years later, though, I think my initiation came during probably Hurricane Ivan, uh, which was, was that 2004, maybe? Uh, I think thereabouts. Anyway, a number of years later, yeah, I'm in there and we're doing emergency management. I've got, you know, local uh, coordinators, you know, and emergency management personnel. I've got our congressmen and women on the telephone, local law enforcement. It was like a real, whoa, oh, yeah. wake up. There's a whole world out there waiting when, you know, the fecal matter hits the spinning turbine, so to speak, right? So yeah, I think that was it for me. But yeah, there is this strange sort of, eye of the storm kind of feeling when you are Absolutely. in that newsroom. Yeah. So I can relate. You know, the, the one story that, um, that I remember and not to, not to go down a gruesome turn, but every time I, this is my biggest memory of nine 11, I was sitting in the newsroom and, uh, I obviously being, I was working in sports. I needed to get some sort of sports angle on this. You know what I'm saying? And, and so I called up the Vancouver Canucks head scout. His name was Ron DeLorme. And we had just found out that two members of the Los Angeles Kings scouting staff were killed on the first plane that hit the building or hit the tower. And so I call him up. I get this great eight minute interview that I'm going to cut up into segments and right at the end, I say, hey, Ron, I really appreciate you you taking the time to do this with me. And and thank you so much for for doing this and on such a hard day. And he goes, hey, Dave, before you let before I let you go, he goes, I got to tell you something. I said, what's that, Ron? He goes, I didn't know the two scouts were on there. Oh, and I <laughs> and I was like, like my heart sank. Like, I mean, we're all working off emotion. And, and I tell you, man, that is that almost brought me to tears right there, because like, how do you how do you respond to that? How do you work? Yeah. That? And that was probably the toughest day I ever had in radio was that eight minutes that eight minutes. Understandably. Yeah, yeah, so I don't want to be a downer on this show, but I figured since we were talking about it, I would throw that in there. These a little so, story yeah, of Dave. We're sure war stories, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is this is all battle scars right here. You know, we're relating to the times and the uh, you know the pressure a lot of people are feeling right now. Uh, you know, from a background in broadcast, and you know, it was news talk for me. Uh, you know, a lot of sports talk for you. But again, that's I think that's that that thing that you were talking about before we went live, and some of the YouTube folks got to hear. The reason that you chuckle when you and I get on the mic together is because we share that thing that radio guys have, and that's Absolutely. something you pick up in the Yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> that, that, you know what? That's probably exactly what it is. Micah, you know, for a lot of people who may not be familiar with your work, because our audience is always growing and always changing, how did you get involved with everything that you do regarding the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird, strange stories that surround it? You know, that all came from 
my life before radio, you might say, going all the way back to childhood, I was always interested in the unexplained. And, you know, my parents, I think my, my father was, you know, a historical researcher and uh, a man who studied language. Uh, his degree, I guess, was in classics. And so he was someone who studied Latin, Greek, Hebrew, a lot of history, things like that. Um, mythology as well. Uh, psychology. My mother, on the other hand, was an artist, and she loved, I mean, probably more than anything, building a big bonfire, blasting the eagles, hell freezes over, you know, on summer nights, and just hanging out with the family out back, sometimes roasting marshmallows, but inevitably the campfire stories ensue. And she loved to tell stories, and obviously a lot of the stories that she would tell would be ghost stories or Occasionally, or, you know, legends about our region, like the Brown Mountain Lights, these unusual lights that are seen down around the Limble Gorge, North Carolina. Well, at some point, I'm probably at about age four or five when this happens, I start saying, you know, I'd love to see the books, you know, where are the books where I can, you know, where are the pictures, where are the stories I can read about? And uh, granted, at age five, I wasn't probably a great reader, uh, but I was a couple of reading levels ahead of a lot of my classmates because mom and dad were like, what do we do? Let's give him the books and see what happens. And so, I mean, really young, I was already reading a lot. And about third grade, I wrote my first report on UFOs. Right. No joke. My teacher had been a skeptic uh, and a very science-minded teacher, which I really appreciate. And she kind of stood me up in front of the class and tried to make this you know, statement by kind of saying, there's no hard evidence that supports what you're writing about. You know, you're going to get a good grade for writing a good report, but the subject matter is lacking. And so I'm going to take off points for that. So you get a B. And my shoulders slumped and I was like, what? Right? And I think she kind of was trying to encourage me to get interested in other things, but it had the reverse effect. I guess I was always kind of nonconformist, Dave. And uh, so this led to a parent-teacher conference, literally where the teacher wants to meet with my mom and dad. And, and this teacher, here I am, I'm, I'm in third grade, and the, the teacher is telling my parents, I'm concerned about your son's interests. He's He's wanting to read about UFOs. He's wanting to read about... Sasquatch. This is all pseudoscience. And it's one thing that he's interested, but the problem is, is that there's this effect where, you know, he's knocking over all the other little dominoes. All the other kids around him are interested in the stuff he's interested in. And my parents kind of resolved. They're like, look, he's reading, you know, yes. that's what's important to us. And so they said, okay, we're going to have to meet in the middle. This teacher actually says, you know, every other week he needs to check out from the library instead of UFO books by Ray Fowler, you know, and, and, um, and actually what's funny is Daniel Cohen was a author who wrote a lot of books for younger age groups, which were accessible to me at that time. Well, he was a psychop member. He was a skeptic. Yeah. So I was actually reading a, a, a noted skeptic <laughs> early on like that, but nonetheless, my teacher was encouraging me also to read literature and to read classics and things like this. So, uh, needless to say, I guess I was a bookworm above all else. I don't think my parents ever would have thought that that early introduction to those subjects and their willingness to allow me to read those things without fear of what kind of worldview it would shape would put me on this path where even before I worked professionally in radio, I'd begun to write articles and conduct research. And I was publishing in magazines like New Dawn and uh, Fate Magazine. Uh, you know, a lot of these uh, classic fringe publications, if you will, Fate having been in publication since 1948, and really uh, kind of launching in response to the 1947 appearance on the cultural landscape of so-called flying saucers, later redubbed UFOs by Edward Ruppelt, uh, the first head of Project Blue Book. So, you know, these kinds of publications that have had a lasting uh, role in the history of the development of ideas in relation to the unexplained, I, I went there first. And then about that time, of course, in the early 2000s, blogs were becoming a thing. And so I launched a website called The Graylian Report. Yes. It's still available online. And uh, the rest is kind of history. That's really where it kind of uh, began to uh, kind of gain traction. And um, yeah, so it's funny because I then go to work in radio. Uh, I produced a radio program that was hosted by Joshua P. Warren for a little while maintain this interest. But as time has gone on, I've always tried to continue to become more scientifically minded and to always temper my interests with a fair amount of skepticism. So I got to thank my third grade teacher. I think that <laughs> she was a good influence, all things considered. 
you know what? I, w- I want to focus a lot on UFOs and the history about them tonight, uh, at least in the first part here, because I think there is a, a lot of intrigue around this. And I don't know if it's just me or maybe it's you. And we'll, we'll start to get heavy into it, you know, right now as we approach the bottom of the hour in about eight minutes here. But do you feel that the history of ufology over the last two years has taken a real hit to the study of it, considering what we've seen happening with the last couple of years, whether it's the To the Stars Academy, whether it's it's people uh, coming out from the U.S. Navy and the videos and the government, you know, talking about it. And thank goodness for the government. I'm sure the Pentagon and all the rest are saying, thank goodness coronavirus happened because now we don't have to talk about this anymore. Those crazy tinfoilers will go back in their closet where they belong. You know, uh, it's funny, you you point out something that I think you and I actually touched on uh, before we got on the mic here, uh, which is that with all of the concern about the current state of affairs in relation to coronavirus and whatnot, I had said to you, it's important that as researchers, we not lose sight of of that and that some of the momentum, I guess, that has been built over the last couple of years not be lost in relation to greater concerns over more timely things more pressing issues. And these are pressing. These are potentially life-threatening, but in most cases, we know they aren't going to be. But about UFOs, I would say this. To understand, and again, going all the way back to my early influences, uh, my father being a a uh, researcher both in history and also in what we might call classics, but also a scholar of language, um, and, and actually a person who spoke and who can translate uh, from numerous languages, I'm interested in the the cultural perspective and the global perspective on this phenomena. Uh, The historical perspective uh, is something that is fundamentally important because when we're talking about a subject like UFOs, again, when I say UFO, most people immediately think of a flying saucer, the classic disc-shaped saucer. And with that, there are certain stigmas that are attached. Not everyone will do this, but I would argue that probably the majority of people, again, if we say UFO, they envision a classic flying saucer, and they kind of attach to that, Dave, the idea of, well, we are talking about alien visitors from outer space. Now, that is a common attitude toward UFOs. Yes. Uh, It is an interpretation of them. And there are valid reasons, I think, why many people would view this extraterrestrial interpretation of UFOs as being a valid hypothesis and perhaps also the most likely one. But in terms of what we actually know, putting hypotheses and speculation aside, in terms of what we actually know, we know that humans, since time immemorial, have claimed to observe things in the sky when and if they cannot you know, identify these, they project ideas onto them. And there is a rich history of that, which is not UFO research as we know it since 1947. Uh, But nonetheless, I think that to look back into time and see the way that, you know, since literal history began, you know, recorded history where humans began to utilize written language and document events, and, uh, and we begin to have a record of things that occur throughout the passing of time. It is interesting that we see a component similar to modern ufology where people do see things in the sky. Of course, we can identify many of them now. There are some fantastic researchers like Chris Albeck and others who are utilizing, uh, for instance, uh, modern astronomical uh, programs, computer programs that help us to look back in time. And we can spot when someone in a certain part of the world on a certain date describes seeing something in the sky, we can actually determine celestially what some of those things were and rule out certain natural phenomena. What is interesting to me is both that we can identify those things in hindsight, but more importantly, perhaps, we read the accounts given of these phenomena that we can now identify, and we see the way that people interpret them as being angels, as deities, as gods, as visions, portents, uh, prodigies, They've been known by many different names over time. And so for me, this, what we would really effectively call pre-ufology, history is very important in that regard because we began to see that there are certain functions, I think, of the human mind, the way that humans interpret phenomena that they cannot fully understand or identify. And we have to start there. We have to understand that really at the heart of all this is human limits of knowledge 
human perception of things we do not understand and the propensity to project ideas onto them. Now, that really, I think, is in essence the importance of applying history to UFO studies. The other reason is simply this. With so many unknowns involved here, with so many speculations and suppositions, we ran, I don't think we can really call anyone a UFO expert. You or I don't necessarily know what these things are. We have good ideas about what they may be. Physicists can get involved about how a craft might operate with the you know, capabilities of, for instance, the Tic Tac or something like that. But at the end of the day, we don't know with 100% certainty really what these things are, what the technology entails, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What we can be experts on, if not the UFOs themselves, we can be experts on the history of the phenomenon. And so that's where I'm trying to lay the focus of my research these days is understanding both the history, the documented events yes. that constitute the history, and then also understanding human perception of that phenomena uh, going back through time. You know, you brought up the idea of UFOs, you know, and to, I always said this, and I mentioned this on Twitter a couple months ago, and I don't know why I didn't think about it up until then. But for those who have never seen a UFO, it's not about aliens. Yet for those who have had contact, it's all about the aliens. And there is such a large border in between those two, it's really hard for a lot of people to figure out what side they want to be on because the two sides are moving in completely different directions as we got about two minutes to go until we're at the break. Yeah, you know, and to that point, I like the term alien. I actually am comfortable with that. Alien, to me, is not mutually exclusive with the idea of extraterrestrial. Now, a lot of people would say, what, what is he even talking about? But again, if we really look at alien, alien would seem to identify an other. You know, this would be a good term for an intelligence that is not taken as being human, but which we may not be able to identify uh, the source or origins. Whereas extraterrestrial is explicitly referring to a entity, presumably a biological entity, not from planet Earth, from another planet, from outside of Earth. And so uh, I wonder sometimes about how exclusive concepts like alien and extraterrestrial really must be. I don't think they have to be. How exclusive the idea of an alien encounter uh, and a UFO sighting must be. Sometimes people say that they've had an alien encounter when they've seen a UFO, but some people also have encounters with what they might qualify as being a quote-unquote alien intelligence where there is no UFO involved. And I, we haven't got time now, but when we come back after the break, it'd be interesting to get into that because, again, we've got to, I think, understand the terminologies, the stigmas, the biases, and the attitudes that human perception projects onto these things if we're ever going to make headway understanding what they might be. But are we making it too complicated? Possibly. That is definitely possible. Uh, and I think that that is a risk we have to take, though, if we really want to understand the phenomena we're discussing. Well, I understand that as we got about 30 seconds here. I understand that. And, you know, but, you know, for the people who have experience and I and that's where I come from, I'm not a researcher. I'll be the right. first I'll be mm -hmm. the first one to say that I'm an experiencer and I'm just a big mouth on a microphone. But for those who have experienced it it's hard for them to fathom what is truly going on because for them, it's so matter of fact. And we can get into that when we come back here. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. One hell of an author and researcher and blogger. You can find him absolutely everywhere on the internet. Just type in Micah Hanks' his website, micahanks.com. If you want to check it on out, I highly suggest you do. UFO Talk, let's get into the history. Coming up here on Spaced Out Radio. God, that was a fast half hour. Where did it go? Where did it go? <laughs> Where do we go now? Where do we go? Where do we go now? Anytime I can throw a GNR reference in, man, I, I will. Know. I will. Yeah. I'm that guy. Oh, I love the G. Yeah, man. Oh, Slash. Gosh. Yeah, he, he's the reason, essentially. That, well, he and Jimmy Page. Well, and Zach Wilde. Yeah. You know, those are the reasons I bought, bought a Les Paul. So <laughs> oh, I got to get a Les Paul and I saw one of those blueberry bursts. Have you seen those? Yes, I have. Oh, I held that one. That really is a, I held that's one. That's a gorgeous. Yeah. That is a gorgeous color though. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? And I was at the guitar store and I'm looking at the, at the Les Pauls and I'm, and I'm holding this blueberry burst 
and I'm looking at the price. It's like thirty two hundred bucks Canadian. So about about you know one hundred and fifty bucks American right now, and I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. Like that is the most gorgeous, gorgeous Les Paul color that I've ever seen, ever seen. Yeah, are those guitars uh, hanging behind you there? At yeah. Your, at your... So uh, let's see. Hold on. All right. If you look to, you can just see a little bit to my right. I'll pull it mm -hmm. out there. That is uh, my Fender Squire. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the red one, right? Hold on, I gotta figure out my hands. The red one right here is a court. <sighs> I forget the number designation. I can show them to you if you want. Hold on. <sighs> yeah, because you're watching on YouTube, right? Hold on. Yeah. Although there is that uh, delay, so yeah. unfortunately, I'm st I'm still waiting for you to. to oh, there he is. Now he's turning around and looking at the guitars. <laughs> All right. So I'll see it here in a minute. That is my red court. Right there. Uh huh. This is probably my favorite. Uh, I bought, I got this one for Christmas because uh, there's one guitar on this planet that I want, and uh -huh. um, and that is uh, Ron Bumblefoot Thal's uh, VJ guitar. It's it looks almost identical to that one. And because I'm a when he was with Guns N' Roses, he would play it during Paradise City. So I, right. uh, you know, considering my favorite song is Paradise City, I uh, mm -hmm. wanted uh, him to uh, him to uh, uh, I want to get it off of him. And he said I could have it, you know. But you know, I got to pay for it, right? This is my uh -huh. uh, Les Paul knockoff. It's a it's a Jay Terser. Mm -hmm. Right there, the black one. Okay, yeah. And the only thing I don't like about that one is I got smaller hands, and it's real difficult to, to get to the upper strings. And then there is oh. my Fender Squire that I picked up at a pawn shop for a hundred bucks for my son to beat up. Uh huh. Everybody's got to have one of those, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But. I'm not a big fan of Fender guitars. That's just me, you know, but uh, I'm not good enough to be able to tell the, the sound difference between guitars. I just know, I just know what I like. Yeah. Yeah. I started off on a Strat and then I became a Les Paul guy. And then I recently rewired my Stratocaster and it ruined me because I'm like, oh my gosh, no, I love this Stratocaster again. And I, I yeah. just can't put it down. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at, man. Yeah. I actually love the color of that uh, Squire, though, uh, yeah. that Sunburst. Yeah. yeah that yeah. one's really nice. I need to get a, a new white piece for it, like the guard. Uh, the, person, mm -hmm. the person who had it before, I don't know what they did, but they, there's like a bunch of, it almost like they took a nail and, and were, you know, putting some like nail holes in it, like pinhole type things in it. So I got to get a new mm -hmm. guard on that, but. Oh, you know, people do so much ridiculous stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. So yeah, let's decorate it with thumbtacks. <laughs> yeah. And then my daughter has a, has a, a really beautiful Jackson, real beautiful oh, Jackson. Yeah. My son, Santa Claus brought him a Jackson dinky and, uh, that one's gorgeous. Fun to play. Fun to play. Oh, yeah. And uh, I got a Washburn Moth. It's a limited edition. It's a cheaper limited edition, but it's just got some beautiful paint on it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then what else we got? I got one upstairs, just an El Cheapo brand, but it's got uh, DJ Ashba's autograph on it. I don't play that one because of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because my son is a big fan of DJ Ashba and Bumblefoot, uh, I don't get that guitar. He, he stole it. Bumblefoot. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> you know, he thieved it. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, he thieved it. But uh, yeah, it was kind of cool though. In uh, in uh, you know watching him, like my my son is being only six. I put a uh, a guitar strap on his little dinky, and all of a sudden, you know, I'll go into his bedroom, and he'll and he'll just have his 
his amplifier. He's got my amplifier up in his room and he's just hammering away and he's making up lyrics to songs and he doesn't know any chords yet, but he's what he's doing is he's really starting to practice with tones and okay, well, what happens when I press this string down here or or the second string or the third string? And that's what he's doing. And uh, you know, and he's just loving it. So that's kind of what what uh um what we've been doing. I, I'm gonna get him into lessons. You know, I was going to put him in lessons this spring, but due to the current situation, that's obviously not going to work. So we'll see where it goes. Hey, one, give me one second here because we're just about 20 seconds away here. Hey, sure. every, hey, everybody on YouTube. Hope you're enjoying the intermission break listening to Micah and I just BS our way through guitars. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Want to remind you that the Super Chat is open and a great way to support what we do on this show is to head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, join the Space Travelers, or do a little shopping at the SOR Vault. Grab yourself a t-shirt. But don't forget, give us a thumbs up as well. Thank you so much and hit that subscribe button if you're new. Here we go. Hour number, or the second half hour of hour one. Here we go. Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Great to have you along for the ride tonight. I want to remind all of you, if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and keeping up to date on the news with Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He's an accomplished author, blogger, podcast host. This guy has done it all in the paranormal ufo field and we're talking ufos with him tonight his website micahanks.com if you want to check it on out welcome back my friend oh good to be here now right before the break we were talking about et contact and how you know for the experiencer the science doesn't matter the the current situation with ufos does not matter because they don't need convincing they don't need to try and uh, put a line in between ufos and and what has happened to them. Where do we find that balance in the research, even going back in history? Is there a balance where the two sides can come together? I certainly think that there is. I was uh, recently rereading uh, some of J. Allen Hynek's work, and I periodically will do that. You know, there are a lot of scientifically minded, uh, and actually in the case of someone like Hynek, who had been the uh, you know Northwestern University uh, astronomer, but also the professor who was the actual consultant and science advisor to Project Blue Book under the U.S. Air Force. You know, when we've got someone like Heineck, he was a scientist in practice as well as a science-minded advocate for UFO research. But if you go back and you read books like the Heineck UFO Report, uh, where he takes some of the notable Blue Book files and kind of breaks these reports down, and in addition to featuring the actual content of the Blue Book reports, he is giving the commentary of not only at times his own uh, estimations of what's going on and his own advice that he provides the Air Force on these cases, sometimes his firsthand investigations of some of them, but he's also retrospectively, many years later, because uh, this book's written in the mid-70s, which is a few years after the Condon Committee report uh, by the University of Colorado UFO Project in 1968 or so, and then, of course, almost directly coinciding with the issuance of that report, the U.S. Air Force closes Project Blue Book. So a few years after the fact, Heineck is giving his retrospectives and noting how a lot of his perspectives have changed. Now, in that book, there are a lot of very interesting and famous UFO reports and he also has chapters devoted to things like the close encounters of the third kind, where not only do we have a close encounter with a landed UFO craft, but apparent occupants are visible. And it's and it's not always actually a landed craft. Uh, there are notable examples of a craft that's still airborne, but the occupants are visible. Uh, the one that comes to mind here is, of course, the 1959 Papua New Guinea incident involving uh, Father uh, William Gill, who, along with around 30 other people, observed these disc-shaped aircraft hovering over the mission there uh, on the island where they were and seeing people, what they described as looking like people, 
leaning over the edge of the craft, and they would actually wave at them. And at one point, at least, the uh, individual on board this sort of hovering platform, this flying disc, as he's leaning over, he waves back at them. And Father Gillard said, by all intents and purposes, these people, well, they looked like people to me. And I thought that they were probably uh, Americans. He said, I thought that this was a new technology of you Americans and that they would land and come down and we'd all have dinner together, but they never did. So the point is, at various times, Heineck says, you know, some of these cases very much sound like a real flesh and blood, tangible phenomena where there's an aircraft and there are individuals often but not always described as resembling humans. And then there are some of these cases that are a little stranger and the occupants are a little bit less human. And Heineck says, you know, I have no doubt that these kinds of CE3s or close encounters of the third kind uh, represent a experience that the observer thought was real. But he says, I wonder, however, what element or what you know stage of reality these actually occupy is this a reality as we know it in in this three-dimensional world in which we occupy where if i'm walking down the street and one of these craft has landed and the occupant is standing there i will perceive this and see this and have this experience the same way that you would dave or that anyone else would or someone in the chat room would if we're both there together, do we see the same thing? If there are two observers at great distances apart and they're looking back at this, do they see the same thing? Heineck kind of asks this question, you know, how much reality is there with these experiences? And so if we're to find a balance, coming back to your question, I think that, you know, you look at how Heineck looked at these cases. You know, we look at the ones that seem to belie some sort of an actual real, physical, tangible aircraft and an occupant. Uh, then we look at some of these cases where sometimes an occupant is observed, but there is no UFO. Is it right to call that a UFO case or a close encounter? Uh, you know, sometimes a UFO is seen, but there is no occupant. Does that always mean that it's an actual tangible aircraft? Sometimes these so the so-called nocturnal lights, as Heineck called them, don't have any kind of, uh, you know, appearance of any kind of a physical or structured craft at all. It's just a very amorphous light. And so... Yet again, one of the issues we are facing with UFO research is that that term UFO is intentionally ambiguous and it can mean an awful lot of things. When we're talking about the contact experience, you know, how many of these experiences actually involve a UFO, whatever that means. And you begin to kind of realize once you look back at the Blue Book files and you look at the scientific attempts by Heineck and others to quantify and to even institute terminology that we can use to relate to this phenomenon. And when you begin to recognize that a lot of people who talk about UFOs, uh, irrespective of one another, mean entirely different things when they're talking about it. So we have to find common ground, and we have to actually first agree on what we mean when we're talking about a close encounter or an occupant, you know, what level of reality this is supposed to occupy. And if there are differences and distinctions, we need to identify those where those exist too. Finding the common ground can be difficult, but I do think it can be done, but it requires, again, using common language first. Micah, I understand that. And, you know, for those who are are really, really pushing the grounds of, look, I know what I saw, I know what I've experienced, and, and you've heard all the stories, we've heard all the stories. It doesn't matter what kind of contact they had. They are convinced that the two are always tied together. And I realize that, you know, the, the, the attitude and the education of it all, it has to be split. It really does have to be split in order for us to try and figure out what is truly going on. But for the researcher... The mindset is different comparatively to the emotional connection that the 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 experiencer has. Are we are the let me ask it this way. Is the experiencer having too much emotion in this topic because of what may have happened to them to even be able to think clearly regarding this topic? Well, I don't think that it that too much is is how I would term it. Uh, and again, I have a lot of respect for those experiencers, but I think that, you know, what you are touching on there is something that is very important and must be remembered by the researchers. Because like you're talking about, I, you know, I, I see exactly where you're coming from. The researcher and the emotional capacity of the experience, it can be frightening. It can be sometimes, you know, just world shattering. Sometimes it can be inspiring. Uh, sometimes it can be all of those things. Many people describe 
after having had an experience where they meet, again, let's use that term alien intelligence, they describe having a fundamental shift in worldview. They may feel as though they have become more spiritually enlightened. Uh, there is some literature that definitely suggests, however strange this may sound to a skeptic, that people actually uh, acquire not only different perspectives on reality, but maybe also relate to it differently. For instance, the manifestation of alleged psychic phenomena, things like this. Now, I don't think personally that those kinds of things, however skeptical a nuts and bolts UFO researcher may be, I don't think those things should be ruled out of hand and dis, you know, just, just completely uh, discounted because they don't seem to fit the paradigm within, the, uh, within which the UFO researcher may operate. And that seems to be one of the problems with UFO research. I mean, I try my best at times to look at this very tangibly, very nuts and bolts too. But the trend you see, especially since 2017, is that there are a lot of researchers, I think, um, some of them are actually good friends of mine, who they see the New York Times article by Leslie Kane, and speaking in terms of recent history, people talk about that article and how impactful it was. But I mean, you know, Leslie in August, or I'm sorry, no, October uh, of that same year, so a couple of months prior to the big New York Times piece in 2017, she had written an article one day after Lou Elizondo had left the Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program and, and also his other duties at the Pentagon. She'd written a piece for the Huffington Post talking about, we got big news on the horizon. Uh, she's talking to Lou Elizondo. She's reporting the fact that he had worked for a threat identification program at that time. So I'm merely pointing out because I should as a historical researcher here, that you know there were articles that were talking about some of these key players that have become the kind of it gang in UFOs that even predated that 2017 piece. I could give other examples. We'll save that for later. But you know when that article comes out and it reveals to the world of, and I'm going to say this frankly, a lot of people who are not really well-versed in the history of developments in the field of UFO research – for them, the idea of government interest in this phenomenon was entirely new, barring maybe having at least a cursory knowledge of things like Project Blue Book. Well, yeah, back in the day, way back in the day, the government, the Air Force was involved. We didn't think that the government was still doing that, you know, unless they had a secret program and were hiding stuff. But now we're learning all this really neat stuff that the Pentagon, you know, Pentagon was involved with, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So people get interested. And it's no time at all. You saw this. You saw all this where people are starting to say, well, OK, sure, we've got these three very unique pieces of footage. Uh, you know, the Navy's kind of being wishy-washy. They say these might be theirs. Then they're saying they're not. I do think our mutual colleague, Tim McMillan, has established uh, without any question the provenance of those videos. They do come from the Navy. Uh, I think that's been confirmed. The Raytheon company says that their technology was utilized uh, to capture those pieces of footage. The footage, again, the GoFast, the Gimbal, uh, you know, these pieces of footage, they're very indistinct. They leave a lot to the imagination. But even the skeptics, I'm seeing uh, guys like Bill Nye, the science guy, going on television and saying, of course there's something in that video, but that's our stuff. You know, I've known guys who worked out there, you know, out there at Area 51, and, you know, this is our own stuff, and, you know, the Air Force doesn't know what they're cooking up in this department, and the Navy doesn't know what the Air Force has got. You know, for my own part, I'm looking at these people who have not really read the history of UFO research, and they're looking at this, and they're looking for the simplest explanations, and that simply must be in their mind. These are our own technologies, right? They couldn't be anything but that. And so, again, a lot of the sort of nuts and bolts interpretation that we see right now, I think, stems from people who are often very new to the topic, and they're looking at the recent developments and saying, well, weird technology must be either ours or maybe a little more on the unsettling side, it could be China or Russia. But the problem is that there are extraordinary accounts of, well, they're actually, you know, extraordinary accounts made by ordinary people. That's kind of paraphrasing what Heineck would have said. You go back to at least the 1940s and 50s, and you're seeing reports of things very similar to what the Raytheon uh, companies at FLIR uh, pod tracking systems being utilized by the Navy, which we're just now filming within the last few uh, decades, you know, you have reports of very similar encounters with objects going back decades. So we have to ask ourselves, just after the Second World War, had we somehow developed technology that defies physics as we know it? Were we already utilizing that technology back then? 
to me, it is a very difficult argument to make. And so here again, I say that for those who are so of the nuts and bolts mind that they must look at this as being, well, something that we built. This is our own stuff, and it's all a new development. If you look at the history of UFOs, you will quickly see, no, people have been encountering very similar aircraft and objects for a very long time. And unless we had this stuff going back to World War II, it's very difficult to explain in conventional terms. So I think we have to look more comprehensively. And there are, yeah. of course, we also have to see, we also have to see, and I'll just add this, you know, the claims of the encounters with the alleged occupants and those, again, for lack of a better term, those alien encounters like you yes. were touching on. These things have to be worked into this this historical narrative for us to be able to understand or hope to understand the the big picture of what we're dealing with. Absolutely. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Micah, in regards to the history, though, this new wave of UFO researchers, they're all about TTSA. They're all about government pressure. They're all about science. They are all about, you know, getting the news out anyway. I mean, if there is a crumb of UFO news that falls out of the cookie jar, they are taking it for miles on social media. You've seen it. I've seen it. A lot of people looking into this subject have seen it. However, what I'm concerned with is we're forgetting the past because the past has a lot of unanswered questions. Whether it's Roswell, Shag Harbor, Kecksburg, the Marfa Lights, Phoenix Lights, whatever it may be, there are a lot of unanswered questions from the past that we still need current answers for. Is this a detriment to ufology that this new wave isn't paying attention to the older uh, incidents, or is this just a sign of the times? Uh, I would go with that first one, and I'm glad that you point that out because, again, I'm going to get in trouble, Dave, for saying this, but I'm going to go ahead and just put it out there. You know, sometimes a little controversy is good, right? Uh, you know, every kid who comes along these days and they read about UFOs and they think if they've got a Twitter account and a blog somewhere online, you know, and a Facebook account where they can promote what they do and what they say, you know, they think that that makes them a UFO investigator. And and frankly, there are actually some very good researchers who are looking at the UFO phenomena today and who are writing about it, you know, from an aerospace or a defense, you know, perspective or whatever, uh, who have not really read very much of the existing literature. And, you know, granted, you also go back and you read in the history of ufology. I mean, there's a lot of very credulous and dubious accounts that have made their way into otherwise very respectable uh, books on this subject. A great example uh, by an author, by the way, that I really respect, Jacques Vallée in his classic Anatomy of a Phenomenon. He actually includes this this rather credulous report of the alleged abduction of a cow, which I believe occurred in around 1896 or 1897. And this had been taken by many UFO researchers as being a true and valid uh, report. And after the cattle mutilation thing begins to kind of uh, become a, a, you know, it comes into public awareness in the 1970s and 80s, uh, more and more people began to link this account to cattle mutilations. The reason being that this individual, uh, the man who had claimed to have observed this cow being kidnapped by an airship, uh, he had actually had a number of people, and there was an affidavit uh, that was produced where people in the community who knew him actually signed this document and, uh, you know, spoke to the nature of his character and said he was not a liar, he was a, you know, a sober man and, not, and an upstanding citizen. And so, you know, by all intents, it seemed like you know, the perfect UFO case, and here again from that pre-ufological era of the airships of the 1896-1897 wave. So, you know, a lot of people look at this and they think there, there might be something to this. Uh, later, it turns out that this was, you know, almost conclusively shown to have been a hoax. And it's later acknowledged by writers. Uh, I'm sure Valet acknowledged that at some point himself. But early on, you know, before that acknowledgement, before the conclusive a uh, solution is brought to the table that, you know, and, and similar reports like that appear in books like Anatomy of a Phenomenon. And so I bring that up not to disparage the work of researchers who I have tremendous respect for, like Jacques Vallée. It is to point out that, you know, when we look back at early writings on ufology, sure, we've got to take some of it with a grain of salt. 
And we also have to look at a lot of those things through the lens of what modern science can teach us. The problem is, as you correctly outline, and I'm, again, very glad you point this out, a lot of the people who are relatively new to the subject think that as long as I know, you know who TTSA is and who all the key players are, as long as I've read all the articles about Lou Elizondo, you know, as long as I've read everything that's been published on UFOs in the last 10 years, I too can be an expert. Well, maybe that does teach you a lot of things. But again, the thing that so many people who are so in the here and now in their perspective on this topic seem to miss is the continuity between modern reports and the alleged technologies that they entail and reports that began to really be documented immediately after the Second World War. Now, people often talk about Kenneth Arnold and flying saucers emerging, you know, in 1947. And right around that same time, we have the alleged crash of a disc out there at Roswell, New Mexico, and all this. But there were very interesting and very, very uh, intriguing reports that predated 1947. Uh, quick example, Captain Jack Puckett of uh, Strategic Air Command was flying to MacDill Air Force Base uh, in the summer of 1946 when he nearly collided, he and his crew, with a large, uh, what they described as rocket-like aircraft that was, you know, roughly double the size of the fuselage, uh, fuselage of a of a like a B-17 bomber, I guess. But they said that this thing had no wings and it was producing a plume of red smoke out the back as it was, you know, just just barreling along uh, at what they estimated to be about a thousand miles an hour, and. They were very startled by this aircraft, whatever it was, it nearly collided with them. They said it appeared to have you know, windows or portholes along the side, but they all saw it very clearly, and you know, Puckett actually filed a report about this after the fact. You know, we look at reports like that. We look at the 1946 ghost rockets, whatever those were seen over Scandinavia. You yes. know, quite obviously there was something going on even before Kenneth Arnold saw the famous flying saucers over Mount Rainier in the summer of 1947. And in truth, when you go further back than that, you also find uh, interesting reports of things. But it seems to me really what's going on is that after World War II, at that point, we really begin to become technologically uh, efficient enough that we can actually observe that there is a phenomenon, namely radar technology, which was developed during the Second World War and put into use and then existed thereafter. You know, technologies like that, I think, were allowing humans to have a better ability to track, to discern, and to, and to grasp the fact that there were things in our skies that we couldn't account for. But again, my fundamental point is simply this. For the modern researcher who's only read the last 10 years or so of UFO research, if you don't go back and you look at those reports and notice the continuity between things observed around that time and things that are really big developments today, the Tic Tac, the gimbal footage, whatever, you know, you're missing some of the bigger, broader picture, I think. Micah, we've got about 45 seconds here before we got to go to break at the b top of the hour. Boy, I'm all confused here. I wanted to say bottom of the hour, a half hour ago, and now, well, either way. Uh, you know, Time's cool, baby. You know, and you make a lot of great se uh, sense that, that makes us ponder and makes us really want to try and figure out which direction that we should go. For the most part, is would would your advice be for people just to sit back and just watch it fold out rather than to attack and try and figure out on their own what is happening? Because I think with that, there's a lot of danger with fake news, fake videos, fake reporters, fake journalists, fake everything that could be out there. Give me a, a 15 second answer. If we got to carry it over, we will. Yeah, you got it. I mean, again, I always encourage people to engage in their own research. Uh, attacking, we could use a whole lot less of that and maybe even a whole lot less Twitter, although I do like social media. Uh, but it brings out the worst in us sometimes. But yeah, do research, but do it responsibly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like washing your hands. Wash your hands responsibly these days. Yes. 25 to 30 seconds. It's all it takes to keep clean. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. More UFO talk, secret studies, men in black, NASA. Let's get into it. Let's get deep. Let's get dark. Let's get into the black ops. Coming up with Micah Hanks in hour number two of Spaced Out Radio. All right, man. All right. I'm going to quickly uh, run my puppies outside, man. And... Uh, do you want to talk to the audience or do you want me to play some commercials? Give you a break. Oh, you know, I could do either. Although, you know what I should do probably with the, uh, the allergy season hitting, um, right. I, I should refill my, 
glass, and then I'll come back and, and I can pontificate. How's that? All right. So I'm <laughs> going to leave this dead air for our audience here for a few minutes. You're not going to hear anything. Uh, and then Mike is going to come back, tell you a quick story, and I'll be back right quickly as well. So stay tuned here. Yeah, we'll have some fun. Work is hard. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Coming to you live, broadcasting loud from the big brown round mound of sound downtown. I think uh, Dave is walking the dog, and although there's a, a bit of a delay on the video there, I think that the chat is in real time. So I'm trying to get caught up on some questions that you guys had while Dave and I were rapping there. Um, let's see. One of you guys had asked about one of my archaeological cohorts. Uh, Jason Pentrail, and yes, I am still working with him. He and I were actually uh, volunteering just two weeks ago on the White Pond dig site in South Carolina, and there was recently a big paper that came out about that site, which plays into this Younger Dryas impact hypothesis stuff that you, I don't know if you guys out there follow Randall Carlson, uh, but also, of course, in the academic sphere of things. Uh, Christopher R. Moore and uh, some of our colleagues, they're really uh, involved in identifying evidence for a extraterrestrial impact that is believed to have occurred around 12,700 years ago uh, here on Earth. And in fact, there's going to be a great conversation tomorrow uh, with the lead author of a new paper on a site called Abu Huraira in Syria, which they believe may be an impact feature and provide significant evidence of this kind of a cataclysmic event that occurred about 12,700 years ago. So the more we learn about the ancient past, uh, the scarier, I guess, it gets in some regards. But I guess you guys are probably uh, familiar with Tunguska, the Tunguska blast of 1908, and whatever that object was that struck remote Siberia. That's definitely a... Uh, along the same lines. Although I'm sure I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to, to propose it might have been an extraterrestrial aircraft. It was definitely extraterrestrial. Something came from space, blew up over Siberia. And I'll tell you this, because Dave told me to tell stories. If you read the eyewitness accounts, they actually describe how all throughout Europe, that the sky... I guess it was ionization. It glowed green that night after the actual airburst that led to the Tunguska blast. So, I mean, yeah, that was just a very, very, very unprecedented event. But again, the scary thing, I guess, almost as scary as the current pandemic, is what happens when something like that hits a major population center? Will we be able to offset it, will we be able to stop the next Tunguska or the next Younger Dryas impact? Oh, that's scary, man. Scary. Welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks, man. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Yes, I had to, uh, while I was taking 
uh, my dog for my dogs outside. I had uh, had to make a quick phone call to one of my sources. Oh, it's kind of interesting, man. Kind of interesting. Hey, you know, I noticed uh, now I may be misinterpreting it, but Chris Mo there in the chat room wrote, "We live in a reboot civilization." Yeah, and if I'm interpreting that correctly. Um, and I may not, maybe Chris can um, clarify that for us. But I mean, the way I would interpret that would be uh, the idea that civilization had already kind of existed. And then we have this dryest event, which kind of is a setback. There's a, a bottleneck with humanity. And we're kind of on round two, coming back around, kind of re regaining our foothold. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is, I don't know, again, a lot of people would look at uh, the legends of Atlantis. And they would say, well, you know, again, 12, what was it, uh, you know, that uh, Plato wrote, 9,000 were the sum of the years, right? You know, before the war that occurred between those who dwelt beyond the pillars of Heracles and everything. Um, I don't know that I put as much stock in the legends of Atlantis, but, you know, uh, there are a, a lot of academics who say, look, we have the younger Dryas, and directly after that is when we begin to see the appearance first of agriculture, in parts of the Middle East. In fact, Andrew Moore, uh, PhD, is a lead researcher uh, who, is, who has traced the beginnings of agriculture back to that por portion of the world and really uh, following the uh, so-called enigmatic Younger Dryas. And I, I'm speaking with him on Thursday. He oh, nice. and uh, yeah, my colleagues and I were going to be talking with Dr. Moore. Uh, very interesting stuff, though, because, again, what it seems to suggest is that coincident with early agriculture and even before it, we've got these sites like Gobekli Tepe, Right, where they were, they were doing incredible stuff there in uh, uh, that was I guess the region of uh, it's actually close to Shanlurfa, I believe, right, uh, Turkey, but uh, they call it um, more broadly speaking the um, oh gosh, I'm just drawing a blank right now. Well, I, I, I got to get you to hold on right there because we're ten seconds yeah. away. I want to remind everybody on YouTube, great way to support this show. We have the super chat open, and you can do a little shopping at the SOR Vault. Join our Space Travelers Club as well, all at spacedoutradio.com. Here's our number two. You're listening. Music's to Spaced on. Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave. We're on gonna have Twitter some fun here. At Spaced Out Radio. And I always like the fun. Spaced Out Radio show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, along with the digital side of Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Hobohemia. Hobohemia is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. we got a plethora of features for you to check on out, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We're taking a little dip into ufology tonight, the history, some of the weird, strange stories that go around. His website, micahhanks.com. If you want to check it on out, Micah, welcome back. Yeah, good to be here, my man. Men in Black, man. Men in Black. I love this topic. And I know many of our listeners love this as well. How come we don't hear any Men in Black stories anymore? Has this program been shut down? Well, that's a good question as well. Um, you're just full of them tonight, my man. Uh, Try. You know, it's, it's funny because... The way, that, hey, the way that that kind of fits into what you were touching on earlier, you know, we've got modern researchers who are, in truth, probably due to the limitation uh, or the limited amount of literature that they uh, have exposed themselves to. Again, I don't think it's, a f uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people do this, but I mean, if you are a researcher, you can find a lot of good information on the web. But a lot of people, the problem is they go down these deep dives on YouTube and they watch videos and they've caught up on every season of Ancient Aliens and they think that that makes them a UFO researcher. Again, there are science, you know, papers, there are science, you know, studies, there are books that are often tediously boring but chock full of data pertaining to UFO studies spanning decades that most people who, you know, only have a cursory interest in this stuff, they don't ever bother to go and read um, 
And yes, I'm nerdy enough. I'm enough of a geek that I've actually studied a lot of this stuff. Yes, you do find the MIB stories that appear from time to time. And we'll get to those in a moment. But, you know, more broadly speaking, and to your earlier point, often what I think is occurring is that people go through, you know, there are, there are trends and there are different attitudes. Sometimes stigmas and biases and things do color and shape those attitudes that change with time. But some of the general trends that you'll see with ufology is that when the phenomena first appears on the cultural landscape in the 1940s and 50s, it was mostly approached from a very nuts and bolts perspective. Okay, you didn't have these psychosocial hypotheses. You didn't see a lot of, you know, rumination on whether there were interdimensional visitors or things like that. I mean, it was pretty, you know, cut and dry. We're seeing aircraft we can account for. There was probably the concern that this was, you know, something that Stalin was utilizing and that there might have been a foreign technology. But before long, it seemed pretty evident that that was not the case. And of course, under Project Sign, an earlier predecessor to Project Blue Book under the U.S. Air Force, there was this famous estimate of the situation which was produced. No copies exist. They were all ordered to be destroyed because essentially top brass at the time didn't like the conclusion, which was, you guessed it, we can't account for what these technologies are. It is very likely to us that they may be extraterrestrial craft. And that was, again, deemed an unacceptable answer. So all copies of this estimate of the situation are destroyed. Uh, Project Sign is followed by another successor, Project, uh, Project Grudge. And then, of course, we've got Project Blue Book, which comes into effect, which lasts up until the late 1960s. Now, it's during that period that some UFO witnesses begin to describe claiming not only to see unusual craft, but also they receive afterward visits from men in various different kinds of garb, but often traditionally they're described as wearing all black. They often are described as behaving very strangely, asking unusual questions, or even acting in a very threatening manner. Now, interestingly, it's around this time in the 1960s that some UFO researchers are also, in, and this is an important, I think, historical approach uh, approach to you know to, to to bring into question here, as we're looking at the actual his, you know the actual timeline of events that are occurring in history in relation to the UFO topic. We also need to look at the changes in social attitudes and cultural perspectives in relation to that. So. Throughout the 1960s, the U.S. Air Force is involved in Project Blue Book. Different heads of that project, Hector Quintanilla, uh, you know, Colonel Friend, and you know, others have different attitudes. Some are more skeptical. Some are, you know, kind of, you know, middle of the road. Others are very interested in the phenomena. Uh, there are, of course, the reports that begin to come out around that time of yes, these visitations by individuals who are very interested in the phenomena and asking unusual questions about it. And then you're also seeing in the UFO research community, outside of government, outside of civilians who happen to see these things and have encounters with men in black, you have a, a research community that is beginning to get fed up. <laughs> They're starting to say, look, okay, great. Okay, extraterrestrial visitors, maybe they're canvassing our planet. Maybe, you know, in their alien way, they're gathering information and they're doing studies that we don't fully understand. But as Jacques Vallée and others began to really ask, they said, how long does it take them to complete their survey of Earth? You know, a lot of the data seems to, you know, smack in the face of this idea of alien visitors, scientists from other worlds conducting a survey of our planet. And then we begin to see these alternative theories emerge. You know, Jacques Vallée writes a landmark book, Passport to Magonia, that really never says what he thinks the phenomena is. It simply challenges the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Uh, John Keel with Operation Trojan Horse starts doing kind of the same thing. He starts saying, look, maybe not all things as we see them are as they appear to be. Then we start seeing in, in mostly Britain, but also throughout other parts of Europe, this psychosocial attitude that really the sum total of the UFO phenomena should be explored through the lens of, well, what humans think they're experiencing. It has less to do with what the objects may or may not be, or even if they exist. Let's look at the human perception angle. What does all this have to do with with the men in black? Well, after going through this kind of this enlightenment era, if you will, where UFOs and all these different theories of origins, you know, come to light in the 60s and 70s and lasting up to the 80s. And then we see this really hardcore kind of abduction emphasis throughout the 80s and 90s with the publication of books by Whitley Strieber and, of course, Bud Hopkins. 
we've kind of gotten to this postmodern era of ufology, I guess. Uh, I guess these days where we've kind of come back around to being very nuts and bolts in our interpretations. You don't see as many of these men in black reports. You don't see as many far out UFO reports at all these days. And those who do look at the phenomenon are almost exclusively treating it like they did right after the Second World War. You know, looking at the possibility that maybe extraterrestrial visitation is coming along, but it seems almost like it's unacceptable to look at uh, abductions, men in black reports, things like that. So as far as why we don't see as many of them anymore today, these cultural trends that come and go, I mean, you have to identify those in the history of ufology. And we're in another of these sorts of nuts and bolts phases, I think, where people are dismissive of things that fall outside of simple, uh, plain observations of weird stuff in the sky. Now, quite obviously, we look back, and I want to give a good example here. In his book, The Mothman Prophecies, John Keel tells in one of the early chapters about a woman who is visited by a man. He's not wearing black. He's wearing just a plain clothes suit. He's got brand new shoes. She said that the leather on the bottom of the shoes wasn't even scuffed, and he's driving a Ford Mustang. This guy shows up, and he says he's with the U.S. Air Force, and he's investigating this UFO incident and this woman and her sighting and all of this. And he even gives her name, which is reported in the book. He says his name is Richard French. Well, Keel decides, you know, this guy was a fraud. Like all these other frauds, these strange, you know, weirdos, these men in black that appear, none of them are really who they say they are. Some of them say they're UFO researchers. Some say that they are government agents. Well, lo and behold, a few years ago, you remember, Dave, the uh, citizens hearing on UFO disclosure that was held by Stephen Bassett down there yes. in Washington. Yes, right? very much so. Richard French shows up there. And he's now retired, but he had actually worked. And, of course, we have all the documentation that shows that he is who he says he was. Some of his claims that he makes and things that he claims he witnessed are a little strange, but we do absolutely know that he worked for the U.S. Air Force and had been a Blue Book investigator at the time that Keel wrote about the events in question uh, under the Office of Special Investigations. And so, I mean, he is who he said he was. He's mentioned my name in that book. And I've actually had researchers say, well, how do you know it was the same Richard French? I guess I couldn't prove it, but I mean, it seems pretty evident to me that we're talking about the same guy. He probably, that men in black case probably can be explained as an actual blue book investigator who had been uh, inquiring about a UFO sighting. Um, so I think that some of the men in black cases relative to that period, you know, they coincide with the, the, the blue book era. But Blue Book reporters or, or investigators are not going to be going to the homes of witnesses and threatening them and saying, you didn't see anything. And if you talk about this, you and your family are going to be in danger, you know, stuff like that. Then you got those real weird cases, uh, an example of one of those. Uh, you know, you got Berthold Schwartz in his book, UFO Dynamics, which was maybe published in the late 70s, early 80s. And he is recounting this strange experience by this man who had been investigating a UFO sighting in his locality where he says he gets a phone call and it was very uncharacteristic, Dave. He says, my family had gone out, they were at the movies or something, and he happened to be home by himself that night. And he gets this phone call from the man saying, I've got important details about this case. And may I come to your home and talk to you about this? And he said, normally I'd never just invite a stranger over like that at night after hours, but I did. And he says, I went to the door to turn on the light in advance of the stranger's arrival, only to find that he's already walking up the you know the pathway to the house from the street down below. So he's already there. The man is dressed completely in black, black shoes, black suit. He's even wearing a black boulder hat. The man, he was wearing what looked like suede gloves as well, <laughs> if the creep factor weren't high enough, as yeah, it no were. But, I mean, he, so, the, so the guy comes in, and he removes his hat, and he's completely bald, Okay, so it's Nick Redfern, and he comes in, and he sits down, and he starts to talk to the man, and the man says, you know, I never felt threatened or anything. I never felt like any of this was out of place until at one point, the bald man who said, he, you know, again, he had no eyebrows. It's like he was completely clean shaven when he takes the hat off, but he lifts his hand to his mouth and the suede glove brushes the top of his lips, and he says that as his hand comes back down, there's a red smear on the back of the glove. The man, okay, had been wearing what appeared to be lipstick, which was smeared on the back of the glove. And at this point, the tone of the experience takes on a very different 
uh, air because he, the man, instructs the uh, gentleman in question in whose home this experience is occurring to remove a coin from his pocket. And he says, I had like a dime and a, and a penny in my pocket. So I pull out this coin and the man instructs the witness to observe this little coin in his hand. And he says it begins to glow blue and kind of turns fuzzy and then disappears. And then the man in black says to him, Barney Hill, as in Betty and Barney Hill, the famous alleged abductees, you know, from the Betty and Barney Hill experience, he says, Barney Hill's heart disappeared just like that coin. And this causes the man to become terrified. He says, okay, this is obviously a threat that's being communicated to me at this point. Shortly after that, the man in black leaves, but as he stands up to go, he's saying that he's essentially losing energy and his voice begins to slow down, according to the account. Oh and then he gets up and he walks out. And he says, almost like a robot, he's holding on to the, to the, to the railing, walking down the steps and back toward the street. And it was just, I mean, it's, it just is so bizarre. So this guy, again, the, the man who claimed to have had the experience in hindsight is reporting this. He was like a clinical doctor is the thing. He's not just some wacko, you know, some, some crazy hillbilly from the country. You know, this is a respected member of his community, you know, a, a clinician, I believe, and he's claiming this man in black, this very bizarre experience occurred in his home while his family was away. So what do we make of stories like that? That doesn't sound like a blue book investigator to me. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it sounds it sounds almost alien. Yeah, and that seems to be the sort of insinuation is that over the years, and again, I don't know what to make of these things. I'm I'm sharing that you know story based on the account that was retold by Schwartz in his book. Schwartz himself also actually a, uh, I believe he was a, 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 a psycho, uh, I guess he was a psychologist, really, or a, a psychiatrist actually would be uh, probably more uh, accurate. But again, looking at this from an academician's perspective, but, you know, Schwartz was very open himself to ideas like telekinesis and, you know, powers of the mind. But from that clinical uh, perspective, he tried to look at this, I guess, uh, through the lens of psychology. But nonetheless, he wasn't saying that people are imagining these and that these are simply psychological experiences. He seemed to think that there were physical experiences that were happening, and hence he he shares these encounters in this book. But again, the idea of something like that, how do we interpret <laughs> you know, something that seems to have this air of being human, but almost more like something in human skin and clothes trying to do its best human impersonation, you know? <laughs> and Dave, that's the scary part about days, it. Well, yeah, and certain days of the week, I mean, I, I, I wake up and I go, you know, what if these things are the operators? What if, what if we really do live in Neo's Matrix and that the UFOs and the men in black and stuff, just like in that film, the men in black are what the operators look like when they come into the Matrix and interact with us. I mean, there's a reason why in that film... Agent Smith appears as a man in black. <laughs> oh, very true. Very true. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Micah, I had an insider tell me one day, I had a very private and candid conversation with somebody who was well-connected. And he, when I asked him about the men in black and, and you know, other sorts of questions to the phenomena he basically told me that you know we're we're not the killing business anymore we're we're about you know ruining reputations we're about you know causing people strife so that way when they get out of the game there is no way that we could get back and yet people who have had these these alleged men in black experiences all claim that you know there was some sort of you know non-threatening threat that kind of came their way are we at that point because of where we are uh, technologically that we no longer have to take people out so to speak and it's much easier to ruin a reputation and and try to to uh, discredit someone that way instead because it's a lot more long lasting and it's less bloody. Well, you know there there's so many things to unpack there. You know you can see with the infighting between you know so-called believers and so-called skeptics that there's a natural human propensity based on what I think is, you know, fairly called tribalism. You know, we have this tribal mentality that we find people who share our beliefs and values and anyone who differs, they are the object of attacks or avoidance. 
you know, whether that's based on religious grounds or political grounds, you know, if you're a different political party from me, or if you are, a, you know, a skeptic and I'm a believer, or if you are an atheist and I am, a, you know, a, a person who goes to church every Sunday or whatever, you know, we we always tend to to separate ourselves into groups, and this is a this is a byproduct of the way that we've evolved and learned to survive, strength in numbers, things along those lines. We won't get into an anthropology lesson here, but I mean these things are all relevant uh, when we when we try to look at human behaviors, culture, you know, evolutionary drives, and the kinds of things that govern our activities and our behaviors. So my point is that in light of all that, you see a lot of that. We will ruin you and destroy you just among people and the infighting that emerges between people with different ideas without there having to be, you know, a government or a superior, you know, entity or organization that is targeting individuals for the purposeful intent of trying to discredit them. We do that to each other. You know, the skeptics on Twitter and the believers on Twitter are doing that to each other every week. You know, we got to dig up all the bad stuff about what the skeptic wrote about for years. The skeptic looks at all the goofy tweets that this believer has made that make that guy look bad. You know, that seems to be a natural human thing. Now, when it comes to the, like, men in black, uh, you know, I, I'm very careful to uh, not take stories like the one that we just uh, heard and say that, first of all, I think this is all true. Uh, and second of all, that, well, and therefore, if it's true, then it must mean this, right? I mean... I'm presenting the story. It is what it is. Honestly, a lot of it sounds very dubious to me. Yes. But then again, I could. I wasn't there. And you see, that's that's the thing I'm always trying to point out is a good researcher will not just rule out of hand the claims of an experiencer. To me, what that clinician and his claimed experience with that so-called man in black, you know, entailed is very uh, similar to, for instance, your own experiences. You know. It may not involve the exact same circumstances, the exact same observation or entity or whatever, but again, it is the claim of an individual who says that they have had an unusual experience with an entity, a person, an intelligence, whatever. You know, maybe it was just a human, a guy wearing lipstick, who knows, you know, just a weirdo, but whatever that represented, I mean, I may not have the answers, but I recognize that as being a part of the experiencer's reality. The UFO researcher has to try and learn to you know, unmarry themselves from their own pet theories, their biases, their stigmas, their skepticism at times even, and to learn to say, look, we accept that for whatever that may or may not be into this broader scheme of things that we're looking at. Great. Here's some data. We put this over here. Move on. Here's a great UFO report. What's this? Oh, here's a flying saucer. You know, for me, I don't know if the men in black were one singular phenomena and that there is ultimate continuity between all these reports and that they were out there intimidating witnesses. Now, what we do know is that in terms of the intimidation or the discrediting of witnesses or misinformation and things like that, there is precedent for that existing in relation to UFO studies. And that can almost in every instance be tied back to government. Uh, the best example having been the sad and strange affair of Paul Benowitz, uh, Paul Benowitz yes. being a man who he seemed to have been targeted, you know, because he was rightly actually uh, picking up on some things that were going on out there at Kirtland Air Force Base involving an NSA study. And he was seemingly, I, I'm not going to say seemingly, he was purposefully misled to believe that aliens were involved and it drove him crazy. You know, and there's a great documentary film about this, which is called Mirage Men. Uh, I think it's on it's Netflix. It's on Netflix, but yes. Guess, yeah, and it's well worth watching. Also, check out uh, Greg B uh, Greg Bishop's book, Project Beta, which really goes deep into this. And also, Mark Pilkington wrote a book called Mirage Men, upon which the aforementioned documentary was based. Uh, it also covers that. But again, guys, this is what happens when somebody gets too close. But the thing is, is Benowitz wasn't close to discovering aliens or anything like that. He was getting too close to government projects that were underway at the time, and they purposefully misled him to think that he was dealing with aliens. And what was the result? The guy lost it. Yes, you know, he did. I mean, it's tragic. Absolutely tragic. On that note, I'm going to get you to hold on there, Micah. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We're continuing with Men in Black. Strange stories in the UFO world coming up on the Mighty SOR next. Oh. My goodness, I just realized that after this show, I have to actually download it, edit it, and send it off to a radio station. 
It's my new night. Yeah, it's my new nightly thing I have to do. Which uh, radio station is it? Uh, uh, it's uh, KZAX in Bellingham. They're going to play, okay. play us between 3 and 6 in the morning. Uh, it's a perfect uh, time slot. My favorite, in fact. Yeah, not mine. I would never want to go live there. Oh, no. Uh-huh. Uh, no. <laughs> between 3 and 6, you wouldn't want to do that? Come on. No. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a small <laughs> station, and they're like, you know, we really want to run you, and, and uh, you know, but we don't have anybody who could do any editing at this time. Fine, I'll do it, you know, because I need the call letters. Yeah, oh, it's always good to have the uh, call letters. I know, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, so I just realized that, and I'm like, oh, why did I say yes? But have to do it. Have to do it. We'll get her done. Um. So uh, just have your professional editor do that for you, though. Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> that, you mean to tell me that I'm not the only guy who edits my own shows? I never. Is that ed- what you're trying to say? I never edit my shows, but I have to for this uh, for this uh, one station. Now you're just bragging. Not really. I now I got to stay <laughs> up later. It's like, gosh. <clears throat> All uh, right. Uh, hold on here. Mile High Craft, how you doing, man? Um, let's see here. He's talking about... Um, let's see here. Where is it? Hey, SOR, anybody ever seen a half-winged chevron? Uh, I have not, personally. I cable cable guy Matt Dave doesn't sleep. No, very rarely, very rarely. Uh, but uh, have you have you ever seen a mile high or like a boomerang type, but one wing is longer than the other? Have you heard about that? Uh, I have not seen one myself. I mean, I definitely come across those in the literature. Yeah, but I've never uh, observed one. Yeah, I'm the most boring UFO researcher. I've never seen anything, you know, myself. Well, that's not really true. I've I've seen some things, but. Yeah, I haven't seen that one either. I haven't seen uh, that one. Greco is wondering if you got a pair of chaps. Oh, yeah, I meant to get back with him about that. Yeah, and he can borrow them. I think he was wanting to borrow them. Yeah, he wants to borrow them. Apparently, uh, he's got quite the Greek restaurant in Toronto. Oh, really? Uh Uh-oh. Or or somewhere in Ontario, somewhere there. Where is it, Quebec? I love... Yeah, I love uh, Toronto. Wherever it is, if I'm ever there, I will will be there. Yeah. Greco. What's your restaurant? Put it up in the uh, chat. Put it in the chat. Come on. Publicize yourself, man. Publicize yourself. I know you're shut down right now because of everything, but uh, give yourself a shout out. So that way we can shout it out, man. I would love some heroes, man, or, you know, like a Greek salad. What What I wouldn't do for a big Greek dinner right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Pita and hummus. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Where, uh, what, when I lived uh, in my old town before I moved up here, we had this awesome Greek restaurant. And then just below us, we lived up on a hill and they built this, uh, this mini strip mall. And this family put uh, in a, an, an Indian restaurant. And, uh, oh yeah, that's... and it was completely family run, and our and my little guy was still an infant back then, and literally, um, we we called her Mama. I didn't know what to call her, just Mama. Mama would come out from behind the kitchen if she heard my boy, and she would pick him on up and carry him around the restaurant while uh, I'm eating dinner, and my Mrs. Sor is eating dinner as well. It was it was pretty damn cool. It was pretty yeah. damn cool, you know, and she would take care of him while we eat, and, and the food was, oh, man. And then to go there at lunch where it was like all you can eat for 10 bucks. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't. I got to stop this conversation because I got cold pizza up in the fridge that I'm going to be picking out on afterwards. Well, you're going to make me uh, leave my self-induced quarantine here. All right. Well, uh, hey, um... Greco says, if you're ever in Ontario, it's called the Acropolis Real Greek Cuisine. 
Awesome. So make sure awesome. you write that yeah. down. The Acropolis Real Greek Cuisine. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you, Greco. I'd love to get up. Yeah, thank you, Greco. Definitely. Yeah, yeah I'd love to get up to uh, Ontario. Yeah. I. You know, the only thing about Toronto is all the Maple Leaf and and uh, Blue Jays fans, they, they give me hives. They give me hives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, honestly. Like, come on. Come on. You know, Joe Carter hit a home run, you know, in, in 27 years ago. Let's let it go. What have What have they done since? All right. You haven't won a Stanley <laughs> Cup in 53 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let it go. Pick up the lawn chairs that have been sitting on Young Street for the last 52 years waiting for the Stanley Cup parade. They got a little dust on them right now. <sighs> Don't believe the people. Anyways. Are they really still sitting there? Oh, they prob- are, aren't they? Pr- probably, yeah. Probably. Yeah, probably. Nobody ever claims them as theirs. You know, it's just like, Mm -hmm. it's like people, oh, I never voted for that guy. I hate him. I never voted for that guy. Yeah, you did. Just admit it. You just don't want to. All right. Hold hold on a second here. Uh, We got about 13 seconds. Want to remind everybody that we do have the YouTube Super Chat going and a great way to support our show. Like many of you have recently, go to our website, Spaced Out Radio. And click on the SOR vault or join the Space Travelers Club and get some fun going. And also, thumbs up to this show. If you don't mind, we'd greatly appreciate it. Here we go. Let's kick off the second half of Space Down Radio. Cable Guy Matt's ready. He's already talking fiber optics. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. So glad to have each and every one of you with us tonight. I want to remind all of you that if you want to check out our free archives because you've missed portions of this show or others, you can do so at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. we got a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. We're talking with Micah Hanks tonight, accomplished author. You can find all his books on online and Amazon. His website, micahanks.com. I highly suggest you check that on out. Always a pleasure to have you here, my friend. And we were talking men in black and whether or not they're still knocking off people. Do the threats still happen? Are they still following people? Micah, there are people out there, UFO experiencers who still say that they are out there. Are we dealing with a government men in black or are we dealing with uh, an alien species of MIB? Well, you know, as I and by the way, if you're in the captain's chair, does that make me the de facto science advisor? Am I the first uh, mate? Am I? Uh, I, I want to be the spot well, to your Captain Kirk. Well, okay. Well, well, technically, the way I always explain it, and you'll get this, is if you and I are, you know, you know, I'm in the captain's chair, and this is a, I'm actually the navigator. You're the pilot. I just need to get you to go where we need you to go. So I'm the navigator. You're the pilot here. That works. That yeah, works. As long that. as I get the pointy ears. Yeah, I just want the pointy ears, yeah. you know, the Spock thing. Yeah. So Okay. I guess you can wear those. You, you can wear those. We'll, we'll give you permission. That sounds good. All right. I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> the, um, with regard to the, uh, the idea, uh, you know, that uh, there's a government component to this, I would say this. If, if we look at the history of, of UFO writing, I've outlined a couple of points, I think, where uh, there is quite obviously a government involvement. I don't think you could really call a- aspects of the Benowitz affair, uh, you know, a men in black kind of case. Again, men in black is a mythology that is built around what I think are in many cases legitimate experiences that people have had. And some of those I do feel like in the case of Richard French, those can be traceable to actual individuals who worked within government with relation to Project Blue Book or whatever else was going yeah. on at that time. Now, it's important to point out, I mean, there have been other UFO studies carried out by government. Uh, studies, assessments, things along these lines. It was brought to my attention, for instance, uh, a while back, that uh, there is a, uh, during the uh, rather the Vietnam War era, there were a couple of limited studies, I guess we might call them, or programs uh, that were carried out have fear and lethal chaser. 
And the premise between or behind these had been that, again, in the Vietnam conflict, uh, the U.S. Army had continued to encounter often what were described as ellipsoid aircraft that produced a bluish kind of light, uh, ellipsoid or egg-shaped, ovoid might be another term. But again, they seem to be describing something very similar to what we would call the Tic Tac that Commander Dave Fravor uh, encountered during the USS Nimitz incident of 2004. Yes. Now, during that time, uh, within the scope of the so-called Have Fear and Lethal Chaser uh, programs, there seems to have been uh, you know, an attempt to record and to try and identify what these technologies might have been. Uh, and the uh, attempts, of course, always failed. I mean, they were able to sometimes, in some instances, track these objects. Uh, helicopters uh, might be scrambled to pursue them. But uh, ultimately, what always would, would end up happening is that these aircraft, whatever they were, were capable of um, evading the very best aircraft that we have. They would always outfox our best technology. Yes. And so the question is one of, initially the question had been, uh, are these technologies being utilized by the Viet Cong? Is this an enemy technology that we don't know about? Quite obviously, it seemed that they were not. And as we are looking at this in, in you know, in hindsight, we kind of have to go back and ask ourselves, you know, they couldn't identify them at the time. They were utilizing the best technology. And in fact, it was some of the most uh, sophisticated systems. I would, I would say probably that they were comparable to what we see in 1977 and 1978 being instituted by the Brazilian government uh, around Colares, Brazil, when the so-called uh, Operation Saucer project was undertaken. And that was an even more complex case because rather than being in the middle of a mm -hmm. conflict, I mean, some would call it a war zone, but people around Colares Island, Brazil, in northern Brazil, they were saying that they were being attacked by UFOs. And many of the people who were going and seeking medical help actually had uh, small holes or perforations in the skin, burn marks, yeah, uh, evidence of, of you know exposure to radiation, things along these lines. So now, again, that's getting a little far off base from the men in black question. But again, I think that what we can say is that there is historical precedent for government interest in UFOs and government programs that study UFOs. Some of the men in black cases can be traceable back to those government studies. Uh, some of the cases are harder to understand and may not have anything to do with that or reality as we know it, coming back to what Heineck had said. I'm sure these people had these experiences, but what, what level of reality do they occur in? Right when a coin you hold in your hand turns blue and disappears and all this kind of stuff, you know what? Where where does that fit into reality as we know it, Dave? I don't have the answer. Neither do I. Neither do I. And that's the hard part. That is so hard. Well, Renee is asking: Is it possible that men in black are aliens that just work for the government, Micah? It's just her thoughts on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there have been these theories, you know, and ideas proposed over time that uh, the government is working, uh, the, the government works in collusion, the government. I, I, I love that expression, you know, the generalization of the government. Um, there are always different branches of government that must be taken into consideration and delineations and things. But I mean, it's long been supposed that within government, if extraterrestrials are some component of the broader UFO phenomenon, that they are working uh, tangent with government, that they have some sort of an arrangement, right, with government. That idea, I, in my opinion, really kind of becomes uh, popular after guys uh, in the 1980s and 90s like John Lear come out and start proposing these sort of, you know, again, what broadly John Lear's dark hypothesis, I guess is probably the name for it. You know, the idea that there's this sort of deal with the devil that goes at least back to the Eisenhower administration where the government knows that aliens are carrying out certain operations here on Earth, but, you know, for various reasons, we allow them to do this, and it includes the abductions of Americans and things along these lines, and uh, and the use of certain facilities here on Earth that are shared with extraterrestrials, all this kind of stuff. As far as I uh, am aware, there's no proof uh, for that, if anything, and again, I'm I'm entirely amenable to the idea that extraterrestrial life may exist, that the UFO phenomena may be representative of that, and that they may be not only visiting Earth but also conducting studies, experiments, whatever, and even interacting with us. I mean that that is not something that can be unproven per se. 
What about it? Uh, okay, sorry. Go ahead, please. Well, oh, I was just going to add though that you know the idea that whatever that phenomena is, if it is interacting with government and working with you know humans on some clandestine level. I don't see evidence for that. It seems to me, based on the sorts of government studies I was outlining, and again, kudos to researcher, Australian researcher Paul Dean. I want to give him a quick shout out. He was the one who is a fantastic Freedom of Information Act request uh, expert and a, and a UFO researcher all around. Uh, Paul Dean kind of working with and, and in the shadow of another researcher who's been around for years, Barry Greenwood. You know, it was Paul Dean and Barry's research that brought to my attention the have fear and lethal chaser, you know, the history of government UFO interests that are little known and very even less discussed. But the point I'm making is that government interest in UFOs seems to indicate to me that government is not involved in or in collusion with, uh, you know, extraterrestrial technologies or intelligences and working with them in that way. So to answer Renee's question, my feeling would be that, you know, it seems more likely that government is just as mystified by this phenomena as we are, and they're using taxpayer dollars when they can, where applicable, to study them. All right. Well, this leads to the next question about black triangles. There are many who believe that these black triangles are some sort of hidden black program, maybe part of the secret space program. There are others who believe that they are of alien descent because of the size of some of these. I mean, we have reports of, and you've read them, I've read them, many have, of people seeing these craft that look to be a mile, two miles, three miles long. And yes, that sounds hard to fathom, but I can't see a three-mile or even a one-mile aircraft landing on Earth and not being spotted. I mean, what do you know about these black triangles? Where do you think they're coming from? Well, you know, again, their origins remain undetermined, but I, I have to tell you this. These black triangle aircraft, I, I spoke with a gentleman named Ian from the UK, fantastic fella, and uh, someone I hope to actually stay in touch with. Uh, he's a very bright guy, and we share a lot of uh, interests, including archaeology. But he sent along one of the most striking reports recently, including a visual mock-up that he had done, which gave me an indication of how this looked. And his sighting occurred in the early morning, full daylight, uh, probably around six or seven as he is walking home uh, along a little kind of a country road in England, and this thing is flying along. And most of these sightings occur at night, but to see something like that in the daylight really must have been impactful. And it seemed to be for him, and he described it as such. Uh, I have received Dave for years now. So many credible reports from witnesses who have described seeing these triangles, whatever they are. And, uh, you know, one had been uh, sent along to me by a uh, gentleman by the name of Andy, and he had at the time been a flight attendant on an aircraft, and he said that we were on a flight, I believe it was between Scotland and probably the northeastern coast of the United States, and this was probably back in the 1990s. He says, I'll never forget that morning where I noticed a lot of the passengers were over there on the left-hand side of the uh, aircraft, if you're facing the cockpit. And they were all looking out the window, and he thought that there was just a plane flying out there or something. And he kind of joked with everybody, you know, good morning, everybody, uh, something interesting outside. And he says a Scottish gentleman turns and looks at him and says, you tell us. And so he goes to the window and looks, and he says that there's this massive black triangular aircraft at a lower altitude than them flying below their plane. And interestingly, he said that there were three lights at the three corners. Now, we often hear in these reports of these large black triangles. The, the, again, they're called variously black triangles, uh, flying triangles, whatever. Uh, usually black triangle UFOs, I guess, is the most common name for them. But we often hear these reports of the lights at the three corners when they are seen from below with a ground-based viewer. But in the report that was sent to me by Andy uh, from the 1990s, the observers, many of them on board an aircraft uh, that's flying transatlantic, looking from above down onto this thing, they say that the lights were visible at the three corners from above. Mm -hmm. now, that's interesting. Uh, they said that the, the thing was solid black except for those three points of light at the corners. It was moving along slowly, 
as though it was either oblivious or just simply uninterested in them. And Andy said that seeing that aircraft changed his entire worldview. So he goes to the cockpit, asks the pilot and the co-pilot if they've seen it. And the pilot says, hmm, that's interesting. We should talk about that after the flight. And so they get back uh, after they land and the crew is, uh, you know, boarding, getting off of, or rather they're, they're disembarking, you know, getting off of the uh, aircraft. And he says, as they were on a shuttle going back to the hotel, the pilot said, you know, yeah, I saw the thing. And in fact, when I was a fighter pilot before this, uh, over India, I observed a, a, a group of flying disks flying at treetop level. But he says, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to say anything about this while it could be recorded on the in-flight recorder. And that's why I said, you know, that's interesting, whatever, you know, and played it down. But he said, yeah, I absolutely saw that. And who knows what those things are? Uh, I have, again, Dave, I have reported, I have received uh, reports of those things for years now from people. In fact, actually, one of the most interesting ones, although it was before I lived where I live now, it was by a man in Asheville, North Carolina, who in the 1980s saw one of these things presumably fly right over where I live right now. And so they're often seen, and here are some of the key characteristics when we're talking about what, what could they be and what do we know about them. Often they are observed flying at low altitude. They often fly very slowly. And they typically are only seen uh, between the hours of, I'd say, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the morning, in the wee hours. Uh, a, a fantastic example of this uh, occurred again in St. Clair County, uh, Ohio, or I'm sorry, Illinois, back in 2000, where members of law enforcement from several different organizations uh, observed and, and actually pursued one of these things across several counties uh, in those wee hours of the morning. And my good friend David Marler, who is the author of a book called Triangular, uh, Triangular UFOs, an Estimate of the Situation, uh, Marler has done truly fantastic research into that incident and more broadly, the triangle UFO phenomenon. But again, if I were to try and assess one thing from them, the slow speed, the low altitude, and the nighttime flights or early morning flights seems to indicate one thing. These are literally, as you, ex you know, if you, if you hear that expression, flying below the radar, these things are quite literally flying below the radar at altitudes and at speeds and at times that they are the least likely to be seen by civilians on the ground and also by radar systems at, at uh, airports uh, via control towers. So, you know, if they are ours and they are military aircraft transport craft or some sort of a stealth blimp, this has also been proposed. Uh, that's interesting, but why they are being deployed in full view of the public, even at odd times of day, that doesn't make any sense. Again, uh, like my correspondent Ian in the UK has pointed out, Having seen one there, they are not exclusive to the United States. I have spoken with military servicemen and women who have been deployed in the Middle East in times of conflict who have seen these things. Um, my team geologist with the Seven Ages Research Associates, which is my archaeological habit, uh, James Waldo, he observed a large triangle flying over him one night uh, while stationed in the Middle East while he was with the U.S. Army. I have talked with people all around the world who have seen these things. I interviewed a young man who in China observed one. Uh, early one morning, it terrified him. <laughs> um, so if they are a U.S. special project, why are they seen all over the world and skies all over the place? Uh, I couldn't answer that question, but they are obviously trying, uh, in most instances, to, to, to fly in civilian airspace and not be observed, which is very compelling to me. Well, I mean, the big thing is, if they are ours, you know, where are they based? Where do you think they're hiding these? Are they hiding them at Area 51? Is there some remote secretive island out there that is just one big runway for all of this secret technology? What do you think it is? Well, I wonder with, again, if there were one aircraft like this and there was a great big hangar, it wouldn't be inconceivable that it could be stashed. Presuming that there are more than one of these things as big as they are described, you know, where do you keep a bunch of them? Exactly. It's not impossible. It's, it's not inconceivable, Dave, you know, that they may actually have one or 12 of them. But, you know, it's it's truly perplexing. It's a very strange circumstance because, again, one has to ask themselves, okay, so let's say that this is our own technology. And I'm certainly not trying to to insinuate that they are not. 
but I would want to know what would be the purpose of having civilian aircraft that large that fly slowly and at low altitude and behave so anomalously. Uh, what conventional purpose could that possibly have? Again, if this is a top secret military aircraft, and this is a fair point that Brian Dunning and a number of other skeptics have brought up, if this was a, se a top secret military aircraft, Sure, they're being flown at low altitude, which keeps them off radar, but that makes them more likely to be seen by anybody who happens to be awake in the wee hours of the morning whenever these things are flying. And plenty of people do see them. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all these good reports. Uh, in Andy's case, as observed from that aircraft, uh, in Ian's case in the UK, uh, and others that I have received, they are not always seen at night. Sometimes they are seen in the early morning. Uh, but they generally don't appear in broad like afternoon daylight. If they show up in the daylight, it's almost always in the early morning, which seems to suggest that there is a nighttime pattern uh, for their flight. But, you know, again, yeah, I mean, it, it almost strains credulity trying to say that there is some sort of a practical reason why the U.S. Air Force or another agency would utilize these aircraft. Uh, what are these? Are these are these large stealth blimps that are utilized for transporting um large amounts of, of materials or of, uh, you know, of actual personnel. Maybe they're, they're transporting groups of individuals, you know, people, personnel for deployment for various different things. I don't know. But I know that there is not a shred of evidence that suggests that there is any uh, indication that links them to government, uh, nothing that's come out in my uh, to my knowledge, and if anybody knows otherwise, please info at micahanks.com is my email. I'd love to hear from you. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Micah Hanks. But I've never seen a shred of information from the Freedom of Information Act request, uh, you know, FOIA or government otherwise, that suggests that these are our technology. Now, they very well may be, but I've not seen evidence of that. And, and that's the hard part is we don't know. I mean, I personally have seen two black triangles. Uh, one had the typical points on each corner. This thing was massive biggest thing I've ever seen in the sky. And the other one was seen with uh, me and two others where we were sitting on my patio and the entire undercarriage was lit up by silver orbs connected by orange rods. It was it was in, very interesting, very interesting to say the least. And so I, I always wonder whether or not this technology is something that can get to the moon. Maybe they're maybe they're based on the moon. I mean, let's we got uh, with ninety seconds to go here. We got we got some tinfoil action right there, Micah. Well, maybe so. Uh, can I ask you a question, Dave? Sure. When, like, what era? When when did you uh, make those observations? When did you see those? That craft? was in twenty fourteen. Oh wow! Yeah, very recently. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because there. There, in, in the literature, it often is in. Well, this is somewhat the case for my own uh, collection of data about these. Most of the people I have spoken with seem to indicate that the uh, aircraft were observed sometime between the mid 1980s and mid 1990s. I do get a lot of reports, though, from the late 80s, from 1986 right. forward. Um. But that doesn't mean that we don't still see them. I mean, some would try and argue that really the heyday of the so-called Black Triangle observations doesn't occur until the early 90s with the Belgian UFO wave where a lot of these things are being seen at that time. Again, that's certainly not U.S. airspace. That's not even over America. Um, and quite often you see reports of these things over Europe. So, But then again, we also see you know U.S.-made fighter aircraft over other parts of the world. So maybe if these are ours, it's not all that unusual that they appear in other locales. I'm merely pointing out that, again, if this is an important point to make actually in relation to that side of it. It's one thing if it is a known aircraft that is utilized you know, by the Army or the Navy or the Air yes. Force. But if we're talking about an experimental aircraft that has not been actually deployed and is not currently in service, that should not be appearing in the airspace over other countries, not right. even Canada. Right. In those instances, 
talking about a U.S. experimental aircraft is so many have, ex- you know, have explained this away as being, that's just not possible. And that's what's happening, though. Micah Hanks is here on Space Out Radio. We got him for another 30 minutes. Then it's the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Dave. Hour three of Spaced Out Radio coming up after this. Oh, that's a beautiful hour, man. Beautiful hour. I'll clap for you for that. Those big black triangles. Oh, dude. They always make... Dude, the the they scared me. Uh, they uh, those things scared me, and um, it's just weird. Hey, I'll, I'll get back to that. I'm just gonna run my dog outside. Do you need a break? Uh, yeah, I might step yeah step away for just a minute and okay. kind of stretch the old legs. Uh, we'll go. We're just gonna have a little bit of dead air on uh, the YouTube side here, and then Micah and I will be back here in just a couple seconds. So stay tuned. Don't go we anywhere, shall YouTubers. return. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> we got a show that continues. Oh.
All right, buddy, I'm back. Greetings, sir. Greetings. All right, we are here hanging on out with the YouTube crowd and just want to say thank you for everybody joining us tonight. Really do appreciate that. Really do. They're good people. Good people. I heard they shower Great. before every show. Oh, really? Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Could that be because they're getting ready for bed before they listen? Yeah, it could be, but I, I think it's because they want to look good for the show. That's just me. Oh, yeah. The nightlife, yeah. Yeah, you know how it goes. <laughs> I do, actually, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm getting caught up on some of these headlines over here on things. Is it strange, weird, a little, mm. a little obtuse? Uh, yeah, maybe all of the above. How's that? Well, yeah, just monitoring the situation. Boy, this is just a strange world in which we live. Isn't it? Isn't it? So strange, yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't read news before. Uh, it's funny. It, I, I went into the uh, other room and saw on my phone. I always try to leave my phone in another room when I do a live radio show, because have you ever listened to a show where you've got, or maybe you've done this where you had a guest on and you hear their phone oh, uh, yeah. in the background? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So rude. Don't bring your phone with you into the, at least put it on silent. If you're going to cheat and have your phone in there with you exactly. while you're doing a radio. It, <laughs> so it, I leave exactly. mine in another room. So I'm not tempted to look at it and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame but you. I walked in. I walked, well, you know, I love not having to have the phone with me. You know, if I'm in my studio here, um, I mean, I've got enough gear all around me. I'm already being bombarded by other electromagnetic frequencies. I don't need a phone in here. And so people can never figure that out. Why don't you ever answer your phone? I'm like, because I work a lot and I'm always in here. Exactly. <laughs> the phone stays in there. Yeah, but I went in there and I looked and it's 2 a.m. here my time. And I'm like, wow, it does not feel like 2 a.m. I'm just kind of waking up and just really feeling, you know the energy of the environment and the uh, conversation here. Me too, my friend. We got 15 seconds. Hold on here. I want to remind everybody on YouTube that a great way to support what we do. We got the super chat open. Thank you, Enoch, for the super chat. Really do appreciate that. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, has our store on there. Pick up some great swag while you're there. All right, here's the music. We got hour three you kicking like off right now. Us. Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. We're kicking off the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. I appreciate you tuning us all in. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to remind all of you that if you're listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, we really do appreciate that. And thank you to those listening in on Revolution Radio. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Hobohemia. Hobohemia is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. we got a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up and staying up to date with Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. For the final time tonight, we introduce our great guest, Micah Hanks. He's an accomplished author. He is a researcher, blogger, podcaster, wears a nice pair of sunglasses on a daily basis. His website, micahanks.com, comes in every few months just to check on in. We never really have a script. We just kind of go with it. Micah, welcome back. Yes, the man who comes to this show for one reason and one reason only. He is perpetually in search of finding out exactly what a desert clam is. Yeah, and nobody seems to know. Nobody really seems to know, but you know what? He sets the passwords each and every night, and we just have to make sure that we use them wisely. Because if we don't, danger happens. Danger happens. I can get behind that. Yeah. And you know what the real weird part about the whole password thing is? Nobody really knows what it means. So when people ask, uh, people ask, well, what, Dave, what, what, what's a password for? 
The only answer I have is exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. I was, I was thinking you were going to say, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. But, you know, I guess that's you know, the MIB have been unemployed for years now. That's what I'm gathering from this conversation. And so they probably oh, aren't yeah. killing anybody. Yes. Oh, I get it. Desert clam. OK, cool. Yeah, it all makes sense. I just I just got it. Well, fill me in when you when you figure it out. I don't get it. But if I told you, well, yeah. never mind, you know. Yeah, I, I know. I know where we're going. Hey, we, we were just talking about black triangles a little bit before this. And, you know, this leads into an interesting conversation regarding the secret space program. But Nikki has a question here, first and foremost. She is asking, Micah, have you ever heard about a gigantic four to five football fields in length spacecraft considered warships? Have you heard of those? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, the largest ones that I know of, again, are these so-called black triangles. Um, if I may offer one brief note about that, I mean, these are large and, again, maybe one football field in size would be the largest that I have come across. Now, you'd mentioned earlier, uh, even larger than that, as we were kind of introducing this topic um, for my own part, I don't know. Well, I don't know. It depends because, you know, if you look at cases like I think I'd seen someone there on the YouTube chat earlier mentioned the so-called Phoenix Lights. Yes, it is known that there were some military exercises that were being carried out over the Barry Goldwater Range coinciding with the famous Phoenix Lights case. Then again, we also have testimony by uh, former Governor Fife Symington who said, look, you know, I saw a large aircraft with a distinct leading edge. Uh, I have a good friend and correspondent of many years named Mark who lives out there and actually observed the lights. He said, we saw these things, whatever it was, it was triangular. And he said that the three distinct points of light passed over the house. Uh, Mark and his wife observed this. I know a lot of people who uh, were involved. Actually, one researcher friend of mine uh, who is also well-known uh, had been out there, uh, Chris O'Brien, who's yes. a long time, a veteran researcher, a good pal of mine of many years. Chris had actually been out there, uh, <laughs> and his story's kind of funny. He'd been watching a ball game in a hotel room at the time and steps outside and sees people just going nuts. Everybody is really excited, and he's like, what's going on? And they're like, man, this this thing, this big aircraft just passed over. And so he's like, I was there. I just wasn't outside looking at it like a lot of other people. But, I mean, I've met and I know personally people who actually did observe the alleged aircraft. And they say what we saw was very large and not consistent with flares being dropped over the Barry Goldwater Range, as is indicated in the official uh, uh, explanation for that incident. Now, maybe there were some military exercises being carried out. I'm simply saying that according to the eyewitnesses, there appear to be some reports that that conflict with that official narrative. And I bring that up here also because in uh, relation to Nikki's question there about very large aircraft, something you touched on earlier, based on those eyewitness descriptions, whatever was seen over Phoenix seems to be pretty, uh, seems to have been pretty large as well. Now, you know, for my own part, I, I still don't know what to make of these large black triangles. Um, something that large something that strange, you know, their their flight characteristics. There's definitely pattern behavior, as I've indicated. And everything about their altitude, their speed, et cetera, would be by design to limit the efficacy of radar systems and the propagation of radar in detecting these aircraft. And if I have to ask, if they're ours, then why in the world, uh, apart from keeping them uh from being known to air traffic control operators uh, at airports that are on the civilian level, you know, why in the world would they fly at those altitudes and in that manner? You know, something about this is quite evident to me. Uh, th this is intended to be kept secret, I think, uh, whether they are ours or theirs, so to speak. Yeah, and and that's the interesting part is where do we go with this? What exactly are there? You know what? I want to touch on that for a quick second, and I know there's other questions out there, and I'm going to try and get to them as well, Micah. However, you know, when it comes to Fife Symington, 
Yes, for the last 23 years, Symington has been the butt end of the political joke when it comes to UFOs because of the way he treated that situation. And it was it was so silly and degrading to his own citizens what he did when he when he the next day after the sighting brought out an alien in front of all the media when people were really scared to make fun of of the citizens. He denied seeing it. And then 15 years later, he comes back out and says, yes, I did witness it. I didn't know what it was and tries to play, you know, the dummy in it all and that he made a mistake and, and so on and so forth. You know, granted other things politically caused him his career, but when it comes to him, what impact did his reaction to this really have to the Phoenix lights? Well, in the long run, he lends a tremendous amount of credibility to the claims of those who said that they'd seen something uh, which initially it was perceived that he was making fun of. But I have a different take on that. And to give you a timely uh, example, uh, if we were to compare this to, for instance, concerns about the current current coronavirus, uh, I have noticed a, lo- a variety of different reporting on the coronavirus and projections about how bad things might get. And, you know, I have felt like as this has been a developing situation myself at times, uh, like there were certainly legitimate concerns, but I have nonetheless taken an attitude where I am downplaying my own concerns somewhat on the microphone. And I've listened back to a few shows over the last few weeks that I've done and the tone that I took and my uh, apparent attitude. And I've asked myself, you know, what was causing that? Because I know I feel differently about this situation now. And obviously, some of the influential factors include talking with expert epidemiologists uh, who are far more well informed on the, uh, the the science of outbreaks and the epidemiological perspective on all of this, and who have not necessarily instilled panic or fear. If anything, I feel more hopeful, I think, now. But it is through the acquisition of information uh, from professionals who have spent their lives studying how outbreaks occur and things like that. But again, to bring this back to the UFO phenomenon and Fife Symington's role, rather than making fun of his citizens, when you've got people who are afraid and they're scared because they have seen something that they cannot understand or account for, when we have those in leadership who seem to be playing it down, it may not be intended entirely at ridiculing those who claim they've seen something. Sometimes playing it down and taking a humorous attitude is actually intended to try and diffuse panic and concern. It seems that, and Five Symington in interviews has also even indicated this, it seems that he felt not uh, compelled to or like It was a good idea at the time. No, he seems to indicate that he was pressured into that sort of response, okay? And that that was not what he, it was obviously not what he thought about it at the time because he later comes forward and says, I saw the aircraft myself, like so many other residents did. So quite obviously, if he was pressured, and this isn't to insinuate some grand dark conspiracy, but it is to say if there were pressures put upon him, look, People are scared, and you're going to make them more scared if you say you saw it too. Play it down, make a joke out of it. His intention, or the intention of those who pressure him into doing this, had probably been very much like, I think, some downplaying the coronavirus. It is better in terms of management in the long term to be able to keep people from engaging in in fear-mongering because if fear-mongering occurs and people start getting scared and panic results from that, the situation can escalate and get out of control very quickly. Symington was probably aware of that potential and wanted to avoid that. Later, many years later, when there's no longer a threat potential, then he comes out and says, you know, I'm sorry if I made anyone feel as though I were ridiculing them, but the truth is, I saw this thing too. I'm I'm here with you. So the legacy, the longer term effect, I think, is that although I understand what he was probably aiming for at the time, he, I think, bolsters the credibility of those who claim that they actually had that experience, having had it himself too. Do you think that 
the the people of Arizona ever forgave him for that. I would hope that they would. I would. Because, again, I think, again, if we look at the way that responses vary in relation to the current coronavirus pandemic, I mean, you know, let's speak plainly here. There are some very legitimate concerns on the table. We don't know how bad it could get. I worry that uh, our leaders, government officials, you know, are not downplaying it intentionally, but maybe really not taking it seriously. But if they take it more seriously than they let on and they are intentionally downplaying it, the net effect to me would be that people are less likely to become concerned and they are trying to offset the potential for panic, which I think is a good thing. Then again, also being prepared and knowing is a good thing. But when we look at a situation like the Phoenix Lights, how likely is the potential that there's going to be an alien invasion? Okay, we don't know, but there's no historical precedent for something like that. It's never happened before. We don't have any reasonable expectation it's going to happen now. Now, we look at like a pandemic outbreak, you know, with a coronavirus outbreak like this, we can look back to 1918 with the Spanish flu. We can look back to 2009 with the H1N1 thing. You know, there's historical precedent for outbreaks and for how they occur. And we have models, we have figures and things. So there's a realistic potential for concern in relation to what happens if this, you know, gets, if this escalates. In other words, with a UFO kind of a case, going back to Symington's situation, why would they have treated that as though there were a potential, a threat potential with the actual aircraft? So sure, leave that off the table. Let's play it down. Let's keep people from getting scared. We probably think there's nothing to be scared of. In hindsight, if I were a citizen who had seen that thing and had been upset with him at the time, I would absolutely forgive him because I think a leader is often put into a situation where they have conflicting opinions, feelings themselves. He saw this thing. He doesn't want the situation to get out of hand. If people had seen it, like you said, they're frightened, they feel concerned. And as a community leader, he has to try and address this situation. But I mean, I think he did what he thought was right to do at the time. And unfortunately, many to this day still perceive that as being ridicule. I don't know that that was the intention. But again, at the end of the day, we cannot remove the fact that he has come forward and himself become one of the more notable uh, eyewitnesses to that incident uh, of all time and, and one from uh, actual government in that period. Well, I mean, the big thing, too, is, when, you know, when I look at this, I always wonder who put him up to it? Who put him up to it? Was it, a, you know, was it yeah. the, did it come from the White House? Did it come from the Pentagon? Was it the United States Air Force? Because we all know that the Arizona desert has a lot of major military bases, especially Air Force bases there. That's what I'm wondering is who's the one who called the shot on that to get him to, you know, kind of play down his own citizens. I don't know uh, if he has ever said explicitly who it had been. Uh, I presume he must have been asked that at some point. And, you know, guys like James Fox and uh, various others come to mind who I could maybe reach out to and uh, touch base with about that. But, I, I you know, it, nothing comes to mind immediately that, that I recall uh, as far as him saying, you know, Air Force representatives came out and said, you'd better tell them it was all, you know, a joke. <laughs> something along, along those lines, but I mean that seems to be what was implied, right? Uh, so I don't recall if he's if he was ever asked about that and if he had stated. Now I did actually have a friend a number of years ago who had filed a Freedom of Information Act request uh, seeking information about military exercises that were being carried out over the Barry Goldwater Range on the night in question, uh, involving like eight and warthogs and everything, yes. according to the popular you know, skeptical interpretation. And the FOIA request came back and said that there were no records existent today of such a military operation, which was seemingly very notable because, I mean, if that's the skeptical explanation, uh, and yet there are no records of this operation occurring at that time, then what were people seeing? Now, on the other side of that, a private pilot also reached out to me and said that there was a, a you know, prosaic angle on that, and it, it wasn't necessarily... Uh, when the FOIA request came back with no records of any kind of operations, that did not necessarily indicate that there wouldn't have been a training exercise that was occurring uh, at that time. So, 
you know, that's that's one of those instances where I don't think that with the information we have at our disposal, unless there really was a secret government aircraft being tested of some kind, and later that comes out and it is disclosed to the public, maybe that'll be the case. But at the current time, I've not seen convincing evidence from government that indicates that that was anything of ours. Um, there is the the conventional story, you know, flares, military exercises, things like that. That certainly accounts for a lot of the things that we see in footage from around that time. But what appears in the footage, the famous footage over Phoenix recorded on the night in question is very different to me. That looks like flares in the footage. The descriptions that eyewitnesses share of a large triangular aircraft with a leading edge, like Fife Symington described, uh, my associate Mark and his wife and others that I've spoken with, Seems like a very different thing from flares. Quick question from Philip in our chat room, who is asking, what do you, the black triangles do that makes them so scary to people? I think it is their monolithic, you know, characteristic there. I mean, it was actually referred to as such by one of the witnesses that I spoke with a number of years ago. He said this he stopped almost in mid-sentence, uh, and, and I had actually been uh, doing a radio show uh, here in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, on our news talk radio station. It was a Saturday night, and I had been doing a show on UFOs and just opened the phone lines and let people call in. And we got two incredible stories that night. But this story that I'll never forget, the guy's name was Brian. He called in, and he said, I want to talk about that giant black thing that moves at snail speed. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah I, th I think I know what you're talking about. And he's describing it. And at one point, he stops almost mid-sentence and says, this, this monolith. And I think that that's part of what really frightens people when there's something that large and something that moves that slowly you know, it's almost more like one of these, you know, like a like a like something out of a Star Wars film, right? Like a Star Destroyer or something. You know, one of the Empire's great big triangular aircraft. You know, it's almost more like something out of science fiction, and I think that's unsettling for people who have seen them. But there are a lot of credible witnesses who claim to have seen them, nonetheless. It, it's very, very intriguing. I just, I just found it like when I saw the two that I did, there was no sound. That's what that too. That's what tripped me out. To me, that's scary. When you see something that massive sitting in the sky and it is moving and there is no sound with it, that was what was eerie for me. Never mind the size. That's just incredible. But having no well, sound, yeah. it's weird. It's very weird. You know, I spoke to uh, our good friend Ryan Sprague today. Oh, uh, yeah. I was good checking. Guy. Such a good guy. Wonderful guy. Yeah, I was checking in with him because he is in New York, which is ground zero for the current coronavirus thing. And uh, he said the strangest thing right now, while everyone is kind of on lockdown, is that at night in New York, how quiet it is. He says that is a new experience for me being a lifelong New York resident. And, you know, similarly, when you see a large aircraft, you expect to hear the sound of the jets, the thrusters, or whatever else, you know, the propulsion mechanism. And like you're saying, the majority of the reports involving these large triangles, the silence is one of the eerie components. You expect there to be a noise associated with something that large moving through the sky directly over you. Most people describe little or no noise, although there are some noises from time to time, sometimes like a, a you know, kind of a buzzing or kind of a metallic yes. droning noise. They can be fairly faint, um, almost more implied uh, than than evident, but it's it's nonetheless something that a lot of witnesses do describe that there's you know, an electrical buzzing or some sort of a similar sort of sound. Uh, some even describe uh, almost like the sound of white noise, right? Like, you know, white noise between stations yes. on a radio or something like that. Those, those kinds of sounds sometimes are associated with these things, but more often than not, they are silent. Yeah. And that is kind of eerie in itself. My friend, we got a grand total of 20 seconds left with you tonight. And always such a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio and to have you share your knowledge. I look forward to it. We're, we seem to be doing this every three months now. So I guess three months from now, what is this, March? So I guess we'll talk to you in June sometime. 
let's plan on it. And everybody out there, it's always great to interact with you. MicahHanks.com. Check me out online. And uh, let's do it again, Dave. Absolutely. We will definitely, definitely do that. All right, everybody. Coming up next on Spaced Out Radio, we have the SOR Newswire and the thought of the Dave to take this thing home. Stay tuned. More Spaced Out Radio right after this. Great show, man. Great show. I'll clap for you. Always. I'm going to give you a few of these. And then you then you mentioned uh-huh. my buddy. Then you mentioned my buddy. Who, oh, Brian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Brian. Yeah, yeah. You're, he's your, you're a good pal. Oh. You know what? I would be to I would be very good pals with him if he didn't lie about his credentials. That's all I'm saying. Ah. I'd be, he was in the military for eight years, though. Yeah. Was he? Ah. Uh, uh, no, I don't think Ron was ever in the in the military. Actually, I don't think so. I don't. He's too. Pretty. Incidentally, he's too pretty for the military. Not, uh, incidentally, though, I was never in the military either. So, me either. But uh, all right. Well, brother, I guess I will turn you loose and let you do your thing. Absolutely. Um, Always great to be on with you, and uh, I hope to catch up with you again in three months or so, whenever there is a need or a call. And if, if I shall be here. Yeah, hey, I, one of these months, I want to bring you on my round table. Uh, the final Friday of yeah. the month. So, oh, anytime. We'll, we'll keep you in touch with that. We'll keep you anytime. in touch. Anytime. You let me know what you need. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen, okay? All right, brother. You take care. Be safe, okay? Yeah, dude. I'll see you. Later, bud. Bye. Hi, everybody. How are you? Micah Hanks. Micah Hanks. Great guy. Great guy. You know, doesn't he have just like the perfect radio voice? Honestly, he has the perfect radio voice. Amazing guy, amazing researcher. So, as as you kind of heard, I kind of gave a little shot about uh, his friend Ryan. As you know, I got a big, big beef. And if you're new to the show, I, I, I'm just going to say this, all right? I'm just going to say this. There is a lot of good people out there researching, a lot of hard, uh, hardworking people in his, you know, who are doing their research for the good of the community, the good of anything. And there are certain people out there that have made a name for themselves by lying about their credentials. All right. It always comes down to the point, and I I know many of you have heard me say this before, but I can't reiterate it enough, all right? If people out there are going to lie about their credentials, how can you trust their research? Everybody, and, and I see it in our chat rooms, I hear it with our guests, on a nightly basis who say, you know, where do we find good information? Who can we trust? I I get people asking me all the time. I do. Millions upon millions of emails. All right. But the point that I'm getting at is there are certain people out there who get a free pass, even though they've lied about their credentials, because they're nice people. And Ryan is one of them. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. But as a journalist that I am, somebody who worked in the industry, has worked the beat, has worked everything, I cannot respect the guy as a colleague because he's never been a journalist. He's he and there are many out there who have self-titled themselves as UFO journalists, as investigative journalists. And the thing is. It's easy to find whether you have been or not. Okay? It is. I have no problem talking about my credentials because they're true. Hell, I had the Dean of Broadcast Journalism on the show a month ago talking about Slumax Gold when I went to school. So my big thing to all of you is Do your homework. If somebody is calling themselves a journalist, make sure they are. It's an important position. Now, a lot of people aren't as passionate about it as I am. 
But you know what? I earned it because I went to school for it. And I sucked as a student, but my hard work got me to the big city. All right? What we do here, why we sound differently here, is because of the radio background and the journalism background that we do. And I do take offense of pe- to people who lie about their credentials. They are getting television shows. They are being asked to speak at all sorts of conferences. All right? Yet the people who are honest... Why isn't Chris Cogswell or William Pullen or Rich Giordano or a number of these other people, Samantha Mowat, how come their names are never in these conferences or rarely, rarely ever? Yet there's people who lie about their credentials and they're all over the place. They're at conferences, they're getting invited on TV shows, there's articles written about them. And I'm not saying this out of jealousy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not saying this out of jealousy at all. But what I am saying is if you want better out of this field, if you want true information out of this field, stop supporting those who lie about their credentials. It's one of the best pieces of advice that I can give you. Really. It really is. It's one of the best pieces of advice I can give you. Take it for what it's worth. Don't fall for the yeah, but she's a nice person or he's a nice person. Don't fall for that. Remember, if somebody lies about their credentials, you can't trust their research. It's just that simple. All right. Thank you so much to everybody who is tuned in to our show tonight on YouTube. Remember, we do have the Super Chat open and our store, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop is a great way to help support this show. So thank you all Radio. for what you do today. And we're going to get going here with the music. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Great to have you here with us tonight. Hey, I want to remind all of you that if you miss most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and... Checking out what Captain Shirk has going on the SOR Newswire. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire, the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the little intimidating and intense. Facebook and Instagram will point users to information from the World Health World Health Organization and censor non-official information it deems harmful in an effort to combat coronavirus-related misinformation. Instagram said in a blog post Tuesday that it will remove coronavirus-related accounts and content from its recommendation site, which typically highlights popular accounts and content unless they come from a credible health organization, such as the WHO and local health authorities. In addition, it said it would also start to downrank content in feed and stories that has been rated false by third-party fact-checkers, and that Instagram had already put several new policies into effect to prevent people from exploiting this public health emergency. To promote social distancing on social media, it is also rolling out a new feature called co-watching, which will allow people to browse posts with their friends over an in-app video 
video chat. Instagram's parent company, Facebook, announced Tuesday that it would also remove coronavirus content and accounts from its recommendations that were not posted by credible health organizations. It will also try to promote accurate information by helping people find related nonprofit organizations to support and by adding relevant stickers for people to use in their posts online. You know what? I'm not about censorship, okay? But this is a good thing. This is a very good thing. There are too many people putting too many snake oil cures online right now, giving too much false pretense to what is actually going on. It's causing a lot of panic out there. We need solid information. Now, I have disagreed with Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram doing this in the past on other topics because I think it's really, really about free speech, even though they are private companies or publicly traded private companies. However, when it comes to this, I think it's a smart move. I really do believe it's a smart move. And hopefully the right information gets out there because there's a lot of hoaxing. I de- deleted on Facebook today from people who were fear-mongering or they were playing false flag UFO videos of CGI. And can you believe this? Why hasn't the media jumped on this? I eliminated... I believe 20 people from my Facebook and I left about 25 different groups because of this. And I highly suggest you guys do too. Go through your Facebook. If somebody is putting fake news up, explain to them. They may not know. However, if they continue to do it, get rid of them because we don't need any more paranoia. We don't need any more propaganda. We don't need any more BS. We've had enough. It's time to clean yourselves up, and it starts with your profile and your profile alone. California hospitals are getting much-needed ventilators in the fight against coronavirus. Elon Musk purchased 1,000 ventilators and donated them to help patients, the state governor has said. They arrived in Los Angeles. It was a heroic effort, Governor Gavin Newsom said at a press conference. Musk tweeted the details on Monday night, purchasing the machines from China, of all places. All right. And he says, yep, China had an oversupply, so we bought 1,255 FDA-approved ResMed, Philips, and Medtronic ventilators on Friday night and airshipped them to L.A. If you want a free ventilator installed, please let us know. Musk announced last week that if there was a shortage, his company would make the ventilators as well. That's also being proposed in the car industry between Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler Fiat at this time as well. Now, here's a fun story regarding the virus. As a means to starving off self-isolation boredom, delighted seniors and their nursing home caretakers are playing a game of hungry, hungry hippos in real life. Oh, this is absolutely awesome. So what they are doing in a video that was published by the Bryn Salen Care Home in Wales last week, four elderly women in wheelchairs were filmed giggling away as they were rolled around a room similarly to the classic children's game. Instead of using hippo mouths, though, to capture the plastic balls, however, the women brandished baskets on sticks, and the results were pretty amusing. Residents really enjoyed playing a new game today, Hungry Hippos. Lots of laughter to lift morale of the team and residents, wrote the nursing home. Since the video was published, on Facebook last week, it has already racked up more than 1.8 million views. Isn't that weird how every story now that's good news, we have to tell how many views it got on social media? That bugs me. I'm going to try and eliminate that from now on. I really am. I'm going to try and eliminate how many views it's had. I mean, these people are having just a time of their lives going after this, and it's just like the video game. It's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Good for them. All right, moving on. Appa Sherpa knows firsthand all the risks of climbing Mount Everest. He's been to the summit 21 times. 
The potential for a COVID-19 outbreak at base camp had him just as fearful as a blizzard or cracking of ice. The 60-year-old mountaineer from Nepal, who now lives in Salt Lake City, applauded the decision to shut down the routes to the top of the famed Himalayan mountain over concerns about the new virus. That meant Sherpa didn't have to worry about the health of anyone on the mountain, including his niece, nephew, and cousin, as they follow in his Everest climbing footsteps. Now he has another fear. How will those who work in the shadow of Everest make ends meet? The closure has significant financial ramifications for the local Sherpas, cooks, porters, and others who make their living during the short climbing window. I just feel bad, Sherpa says, who established a foundation to help Nepalese students with their education. He feels for everyone. Ferba Angel was all set for spring work guiding Western climbers to the 29,035-foot Everest summit when he heard the news nearly two weeks ago. He has already scaled Everest nine times and makes about $7,000 per season. That was money he desperately needs for his two sons' school, rent, and groceries. Now, Angel said, I don't have much. Also losing money are clients who dole out anywhere between $35,000 to $85,000 to be led up the mountain and expedition operators who have expenses to pay despite the closure. It is devastating for the tourism industry of Nepal and abroad, said Lucas Furtenbach, a mountain nearing guide and founder of Furtenbach Adventures, many businesses will not survive this. China shut down the northern route, though, through Tibet due to the pandemic on March 12th. A day later, expeditions to the Nepal site were closed, too. Everest straddles the border between Nepal and China and can be climbed from both sides. By shutting down the passage through the south route of Everest, the Nepal government stands to lose some $4 million in permits alone. There are thousands of people who depend on that money spent by climbers in Nepal. They have no income right now, nothing, Appa Sherba said, but the government made the right decision. The lives are more important. According to Ang Tershing, a mountaineering expert in Nepal, the mountaineering industry in the region brings in about $300 million annually, and most of it during the spring climbing season that begins in March and ends in May. The closure of the mountains has made thousands of people jobless in the mountaineering community, he said. In setting up a potentially risky proposition in 2021, overcrowding on the mountain, there will be a backlog of clients eager to make the trek, along with new batches of climbers. Last May, a climber snapped a, memor a memorable photo from a line with dozens of hikers in colorful winter gear that snaked into the sky. Climbers were crammed along a sharp edge ridge above South Coal with a 7,000 foot drop on I either side, all clipped onto a single line of rope, trudging toward the top of the world. It would be very important that Nepal puts reasonable regulations in place for operators and climbers for next year, said Furtenbach, who resides in Austria and spends time at Lake Tahoe. Otherwise, I see that risk for a total mess next year. A French athlete whose racing plans were foiled by the pandemic held his own marathon on his 23-foot-long balcony. Alicia... Nokomovic, who had been scheduled to run the March 15th Barcelona Marathon before it was cancelled due to the outbreak, ran 26.2 miles on the 23-foot-long outside his apartment in the city of Balma. Nakamovic said it took him six hours, 48 minutes to complete the approximate 3,000 laps that it took to run the distance of the marathon. The runner, who has completed 36 official marathons, said the balcony run was more challenging than his previous runs because the short track made it impossible to build momentum or speed while running. Nakamovic says his girlfriend acted as his support team, feeding him M&Ms and Coca-Cola as, as he ran. The runner dedicated his accomplishments to medical staff working long hours during the viral pandemic. A New Hampshire man apparently did not take kindly to a neighbor's request for him to turn down his music. Manchester police said 47-year-old grabbed a sword and then chased the man yeah, with a sword. Who does that in today's age? We're not in medieval times here, dude. Anyways, he chased his neighbor with a sword who knocked at his door on Monday evening. Police responded to Elms. Well, yeah, it's on Elm Street. Swords. Freddy's hand. Yeah. Here, yeah. This all makes sense now. Anyways, they responded at about 515 p.m. for a report of a sword threat. 
They say Benjamin Leyland chased his neighbor with a two and a half foot sword, but he got away and there were no injuries. Officers arrested Leyland and charged him with criminal threatening. He was due to be arraigned in Hillsborough Superior Court sometime this afternoon. We'll have to get an update on that. Who does that? Who chases someone with a sword? Why do you do that? What, are you going to party like it's fourteen ninety nine again? Holy cow. Don't get it. Don't get it. All right. Two men are facing federal charges in Florida. Oh, you know where this is going. You know where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> Florida man never seems to to, to uh, defeat us, does he? Oh, God bless him. God bless Florida man. Two men are facing federal charges in Florida for using small explosions to rob ATMs in the Tampa Bay area, according to authorities. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Tampa has charged Mado Malik Sala of Clearwater and Kirk Douglas Johnson of Anderson, South Carolina, with conspire, conspiring rather to commit arson. They could each face up to 20 years in prison. Sala and Johnson took nearly $70,000 from several Florida ATMs between November and January and vandalized others without taking any cash, according to a criminal complaint. Investigators believe the men injected some type of flammable fuel into the machines and used a spark to ignite it. The men were arrested Sunday after setting off an explosion at an ATM in Watkinsville, Georgia, prosecutors said. That ATM was damaged, but Sala and Johnson were unable to retrieve any cash from it. Online court records didn't list the attorneys, but these two men, well, let's just say that they're going to need some bank to get out of jail. Let's get to it, shall we? Where's the clown, Marty? I'm looking. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Marty. That's kind of eerie. Marty on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Thought of the Dave happens every night at this time where we get a question that I put together during the day and then I post it on Facebook and Twitter just to read your responses on the air. Why? Because we love the audience participation around here. You guys make it all sorts of fun. So today's Thought of the Dave is as follows. What is your favorite board game and why? Growing up for me, it was Clue. And then remember in the 80s, the game Stop Thief came out? Where it had like that little, I don't know, it looked like a, like a, a handheld phone. Not a cell phone, but like an old house phone. And you had to press the digits and then you could hear if the criminal was getting away. That was my favorite. I'd love to get that game again. I might have to go on eBay to see if I can get that game or Amazon. But that was mine. Clue. I loved Clue. Wasn't a big Monopoly guy. Wasn't a big life guy. Yahtzee. Played a lot of Yahtzee growing up. Well, let's read what you guys enjoyed. Shanna on Twitter. Yahtzee's my fave. Okay, maybe it doesn't exactly have a board, but you get to throw dice and have to keep score. Best part is you get to yell Yahtzee and then do the happy in your face dance when you reach that coveted number. Oh, you're so right, Shanna. You're so right. Bruce, chess, almost endless mind exercises in conflict extrapolation. Ronnie Love, backgammon, the feline philosopher, it was the first time I got that, and he's talking about mouse trap, and then it had to be put together first. I love the whole cause and effect of it all. I spent more time making it precise so that the guy fell in the tub, which I filled with water or pudding sometimes, because why not? Trombone Kim, ticket to ride, easy to learn, many strategies, but must let, much less complicated than Monopoly. I've never heard of ticket to ride. William Haynes. Axis and Allies, great weekend game when I was in the Army. Played that once. Once. All right, let's go to Facebook. 
see what's happening here. Sylvia Love Monopoly. She doesn't tell us why, though. I wish she would. VE. Axis and Allies. Series of World War II strategy board games. Revered by history buffs and strategy game enthusiasts worldwide. I played it before I joined the Army, and I was good enough to win. I play it now on the PC. Free download. Barbara. She loves Scrabble. That way you learn new words. Paul. Game of life. Always fun to see what happens and who gets children first. Tim. Or pardon me, Tina. Battleship. Retired cop. That's why. Andrea. Monopoly. Monopoly. But you turn over a table one time and you're labeled a sore loser for life and now no one will play with you. Ugh. Nicholas, do tabletop RPGs count? If yes, because I love to tell stories with my pals and we always end up with hilarious memories. If no, Quest for the Philosopher's Stone. It is an adventure game that involves traveling through a fantasy world and solving puzzles. Caden, Clue, finally. It's just a fun classic. Gets you to really use your brain. Heather, is Naked Martini Twister considered a board game? For you, Heather, yes it is. Jim, risk. The stains of a thousand high school lunches on my game. Fond memories of my late friend Dallas Wood. We had armies so big we just wrote down the numbers, just a few game pieces on each country. Made it easier to start over the next day. Ukraine nearly wiped out with mustard and mayo stains. Scott, chess, for obvious reasons. Brian, my wife, wait a minute. You said board game, right? Or broad game. Oh, that's bad, Brian. Bad. Gabe, Fireball Island, mainly because it's too expensive to buy now on the internet, but it was damn near perfect board game I loved as a kid. Larry, Risk, remember the great times in college. John, Stratego, uh, Stratego because... It is the best board game ever. Bob, Monopoly because it takes forever and there's some strategy involved. Ron, he's a Stratego. Why can't I say that? Stratego fan. Played it as a kid and brings back memories. Penman loves the brain power of dominoes. Debbie, it's all about risk. Takes hours to play. Bernadette loved Candyland. Carrie, Romoli because it is cards, gambling, and a board game all rolled into one. Tom, don't know if this counts, but the original Dungeons and Dragons, yes, that does count. Kevin and Kevin's beard, he loves Uno. The kids love it, and it brings the family to the table for something other than food. Tom Whitmore, former guest, Stratego. Why? You don't know what the other side has. It requires a lot of thinking and reasoning because you have incomplete information. Jim, Snakes and Ladders, just always found it a fun game as a kid. Carol, does cribbage count? Of course it does. We'll allow that. Nicole, sorry, because I never was. Sorry, not sorry. And that's where we're going to leave it for tonight. Thank you so much for everybody participating in the Thought of the Dave. We'll do it again on Facebook and Twitter tomorrow as well. And a big thank you to Captain Shirk for getting our SOR Newswire together. You can find it at spacedoutradio.com, as well as our guest tonight, Micah Hanks. If you haven't read one of Micah's books, please go get it. Also, you can check out his website at micahhanks.com. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody taking part in our chat rooms on Facebook, Twitter, at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Yeah, you're beautifully snarky tonight. Revolution Radio, LGAB, the SOR Space Travelers Club on our website, all of our YouTubers, you guys were absolutely awesome, and Spreaker, we can't forget you lovelies in there. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for sharing your evening with us, because together, my friends, we own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home.
Have a great night, everybody. Get some sleep while you can. Everybody have a great day tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Good night. Come on, move it on over. Oh, thanks, I'm done. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, goodness. Close that off. All right, everybody on YouTube. I got to cut this short because I have a bunch of editing that I need to do. So bear with me as I got to cut out a little bit early tonight and um, make things happen. So I apologize. I'm a little behind right now, but I've probably got another two and a half hours work to go before I have to go to bed. So I wholeheartedly apologize, but I am going to cut this one a little bit short. But you know what? The good part about it is we all get to hang out tomorrow as well. And I want to say thank you to Enoch for the super chat. And um, yeah, we'll do it all again tomorrow. But I do have to run. I got some editing I need to do and some commercials I need to cut. And that way you guys know that I'm not just bailing on you because I just want to head on home and go to bed, even though I am at home and not in bed. But I do have my sweatpants on. I don't have my pajamas on tonight. But thank you so much for tuning us in. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Really appreciate your time. And do me the favor, spread the word. Spread the link to this. I, I post the link. I try and post it about uh, an hour to two hours before the show. Really appreciate you doing that. That's how we're going to build a crowd. That's how we're going to spread the word. It's all because of you. So thank you so much. Much love to each and every one of you. And we'll do it all again tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing each and every one of you. And